Good morning, councillors. Good morning, officers. Uh, welcome to this uh, session of the Economic and Development Select Committee. Um, if we go uh, straight into the agenda and uh, agenda item number one, apologies for absence. You have apologies, Richard? Uh, just one apology, Chair, from Councillor Roden. Thank you very much. Uh, item two, declarations of interest in items on the agenda. Happy to take as and when. Yep, okay, thank you. Number th item uh, number three is the public open forum. Um, I understand there are potentially some members of the public who are going to present uh, this morning on broadband. Um, they're not here at the moment, so would you be happy to um, defer this item further down the agenda? Yep, okay, thank you. If... Um, before we go into um, the the minutes uh, and sort of the, the meat of the agenda as a whole, um, if we can do some, um, perhaps some introductions for officers uh, who've attended this morning. Thank you. Uh, good morning, I'm Sean Haywood and I'm Head of Digital Services. I know I've met some of you new members at the Members Induction Day, but uh, I'm sure I'll get to know you. Good morning. Oh, can you hear me? Um, my name is Sarah Stevens. I'm um, uh, acting assistant director for um, SRS. Uh, my remit is currently with um, schools, so I'm here with Sharon on the schools project. Okay, thank you. Perhaps we should go around as councillors as well, just to introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Councillor Paul Pavia. I'm uh, chair of this committee. Hazel Eilert, the council scrutiny lead. Richard Williams, Democratic <coughs> Services. Uh, Debbie Blakeborough, Vice Chair of this committee. Councillor Alan Davis, Member of the Committee. Matt Fakins, Member of the Committee. Jess Becker, Member of the Committee. Uh, David Dovey, County Councillor St. King's Mark Ward, Chapstow, a Member of the Committee. Uh, Richard Jones, Policy and Performance Officer, here to present the performance report item later on the agenda. Councillor Val Smith, Lambadoc Ward, observing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just, um, Councillor Devi, can you just possibly flick your microphone off? Thank you very much. Um, and Councillor Smith, you're always welcome at this committee. I know you're, you, you're an avid observer at, at, at most select committees, but you're always welcome here. Um, Okay, if we uh, go into agenda item four, which is to confirm the minutes of the previous meeting. Um, so we just look at them on block. Is everyone happy that they're true and accurate reflection? Yeah, yeah. move, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Devi. Okay, item number five um, is the uh, ICT in schools project update. I think um, Sean is going to lead on this with, with Sarah, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Pavia. Um, sometimes I come into um, select committees with a little bit of trepidation, but I'm thrilled to come here today um, because this project that we entered into about 18 months ago now um, is almost complete. It will be closed in September and it has uh, come out on budget and on time. So for us, it's, it's really nice to report a, a quite a positive project impact. So um, I think it's worth explaining, because I, I know that some new members are in here today, that it's essentially a technical project. It's um, dealing with the infrastructure, um, the sort of the wires, the whistles, the bells of the actual equipment and the technical equipment that we've got. Um, it's not a teaching and learning and curriculum project. Um, the way that people, children, teachers teach in schools is completely separate from the actual ICT platforms and provisions that sit in the background and which will launch um, digital teaching and learning, okay? <clears throat> For the benefit of our new members, um, I'd like to explain what the SRS service is. 
It's our um, IT providers, <coughs> and around about six years ago, um, we joined up Monmouthshire, Gwent Police, and Torvine ICT sections and services so that we could make advantage of um, economies of scale and um, things like sharing knowledge, expertise, and the way that we did that was by transferring all the IT services, the infrastructure, the databases, the servers, up to a state-of-the-art data center in Blynavon. You may well have heard of the SRS services, but I know a lot of new members may not have heard of that. Um, it's been operating quite successfully for the last six years, and we've recently introduced uh, Blyna Gwent and Newport authorities into the SRS. Um, it's run by a chief technical officer under a memorandum of understanding. So we, we are effectively all partners in the SRS service. Um, it has been difficult on times to bring all of the different cultures and the different ways of working together. Um, but effectively, it's providing an excellent service for our, for our, our ICT infrastructure provision. I haven't got my teeth in this morning. Um, so it was the SRS who were actually introducing and delivering on this particular <coughs> ICT project in schools. Um, previously, the SRS had an arrangement with schools where we had just two technicians that covered the whole of the school estate, um, repairing their equipment, repairing their Wi-Fi, and making sure that the infrastructure was, was uh, sufficient there. Um, those two technicians were servicing equipment um, and sort of like laptops, computer equipment, which was dead in the water. Uh, schools are delegated their budgets to, with which to buy their um, ICT equipment and services. They spent it in varying different ways. Some spent a lot on technology, some spent different amounts on different things. Some spent a lot on um, the Ferraris of the technology world, but it wasn't matched with the actual um, roads that go into the schools for them to drive it on. Um, across Monmouthshire, there's very poor broadband provision. So some of the schools had excellent equipment, but they couldn't actually use it because the broadband provision wasn't sufficient for, for them to actually drive their Ferraris on the country lanes. Um, some schools had very poor, outdated XP equipment. Um, and all this together, plus the, um, the low level of technician support, meant that schools were coming out of, um, children were coming out of the schools with different levels of um, digital expertise, uh, different levels of digital knowledge, and different levels of being able to use the equipment. It wasn't sustainable in the long term. If we are going to provide uh, 21st century education services, um, but to have children going out of the primary sector into the secondary sector with in inadequate um, ICT infrastructures and, and digital knowledge and skills, it wasn't going to help our children go into the future digital economies and take advantage of um, becoming developers and people in the, dig um, in the digital world. And with Monmouthshire being such a rural area, we really heavily uh, rely on the digitisation and the uh, electronic delivery within the rural areas. Um, to rectify this situation, we did an audit across all schools, looking at the state of their equipment, the state of their Wi-Fi, the um, broadband provision into the schools, and we raised a business case to actually um, put together a, a constructive um, replacement upgrade of, of all of people's broadband and all of the equipment and infrastructure, plus the equipment and infrastructure that they had on schools' premises themselves for their servers. Some of the, their servers were very old and it could effectively have wiped out all of the information in that school if those servers had died. 
So we, we decided that it would be better to invest in increased infrastructure and at the same time take all of those, uh, decommission the school-based servers and transfer all of that up to the state-of-the-art data centre in Blynavon. If you're looking at the data centre in Blynavon, uh, it's from there that they operated securely things like the NATO conference. Um, so it really is robust <coughs> technical uh, service provision. Um, not many schools across Wales have provided what we've provided in this project, which is 100 meg broadband speeds, speeds into all schools and one gigabyte speeds into the secondary schools. As part of this project, when we were actually introducing all of these broadband speeds, it sometimes meant working with BT, open reach. It sometimes meant digging up the roads, um, putting traffic control in place, um, and across you know, open countryside, so that we were able to replace those country lanes of service provision with um, at least a dual carriageway, if not a motorway, um, so that people who had the Ferraris of equipment could actually use it effectively on the dual carriageways. When we're talking about replacing the equipment, we didn't give people Ferraris. It, the marginal gains from having a Ferrari wasn't worth it. Um, so we gave people effectively um, if I could use the analogy, we gave them a Ford, Ford Focus, I think, didn't we? So that it could get you from A to B, and it, everybody had a consistent standard of service and equipment, and, um, and they were able to run their Ford Focuses effectively down the du dual carriageways that we provided for them. That, for me, being a non-technical person, is the only way I can just describe what, what we've done for schools. But it effectively means now that um, all of our Momisha schools have got this um, upgraded service and standard. And going forward, they can produce children into secondary education with a consistent standard of digital expertise. As I said earlier, this doesn't impact on the teaching and learning aspects within the schools themselves. That is dealt with by... Um, uh, digital achievement standards for the school children, which are laid down by Welsh Government. And we've also got for the teachers um, our Education Achievement Service, um, which monitors the performance and standards of teaching. And they're currently um, working across all of Monmouthshire, well, all of the schools in South East Wales, but uh, in Monmouthshire as well, um, to get schools to have their own digital strategy which addresses digital teaching and learning and, and address, I know that um, Councillor Becker was inquiring about the coding clubs and things like that. <coughs> so for us, um, we have almost, but not quite, finished this project. There were a couple of um, schools that were very difficult to reach. Um, Mountain House in Chepstow being a particular version where they were located at the end of a very long, well, almost like a dirt track. Um, we had problems with access across fields and land ownership. There have been, <laughs> there have been uh, considerable problems with um, working whilst maintaining business as, as usual within the schools. We've had an awful lot of problems with BT and open reach. No, really. uh, yeah, that's <laughs> quite surprising, isn't it? I have the same problems at home. Um, but <laughs> all of this uh, has been overcome, um, and we are very, uh, rightly very proud of what we've achieved here in Monmouthshire because it hasn't been achieved anywhere else in, in Wales. Um, I know that um, we appointed some temporary members of, of staff in the SRS to actually deliver this project. Um, we are rather hoping that some of those staff can get jobs dealing with um, other schools. I know that Blyna Gwent and Torvine are adopting a, a similar approach, approach to Monmouthshire, perhaps not quite as um, comprehensive well or robust, <laughs> yeah, or well-funded. Um, 
and uh, so we are suitably proud that this is, has been a success for us. You as scrutiny committee um, have uh, heard reports from me um, several times in the past. I've gone over it in more detail because I'm aware that there are new members here and also I wanted to explain what the role of the SRS was. You may be thinking, what's my role in all of this? Because I'm not a technical person. I'm head of digital, but I'm actually head of uh, the way that people work in Monmouthshire in a digital world. So um, using technology to enable that to happen and bringing uh, our workforce and our communities into tw 21st century digital-based customer services. Um, that's... It, in a nutshell for me, from, from the report. At the back of the report, you can see some of the areas where we haven't quite finished the project off. Um, and uh, if any members want to ask any questions on that, um, I'll pass you on to Sarah to answer it because she's got far more technical knowledge of what's gone wrong than I have, uh, or why we haven't finished in some of these schools. Um, that's it for me, I think. Thank you, Sean. Um, before I go into uh, discussion and questions, um, I'd just like to declare an interest, uh, a personal interest on this agenda item as a, a governor of uh, a primary, sc primary school, St Mary's Primary School in, in Chepstow. So um, I, I make sure I've, I've flagged that up. Um, Councillor Devi. So, Mr Chairman, I'd like to uh, declare a similar interest um, I'm a governor of Chepstow School as well. <coughs> and, and again, uh, governor of um, Monmouth Comp. Thank you. If um, you can fill your forms in and just um, uh, give them to Richard uh, at the end of this meeting, that would be, be great. If I take questions then, perhaps Councillor Blakeborough, uh, Councillor Feekins, and then Councillor Becker. Thanks, Chair. Um, Thank you for the report. Um, it, it's good to have it because it does show that Monmouthshire has taken the whole ICT digital world seriously. Um, I've got five specific questions and then uh, two generic uh, questions, if that's okay. Um, so going to the specific questions, shall I just ask the five in one go? Will you remember? You'll be all right. Um, in 30, uh, 3.6a, when you're sort of looking at um, the SRA, Office of Robust and Resilient School ICT Network, um, just a question around why do we use that? Because I know on the national learning platform, they use the cloud for storage. So just wondering why we're not using the cloud for storage. Um, um, because say, I think a lot of authorities use that. Um, part C. Um, when you're looking at the 100 uh, megabytes, um, I guess it's a question about the corporate capacity. So there's a question around if every single school was really taking up this ICT and every single school and every child was on an iPad, all plugged into the system, could we take it um, on a corporate level? Um, um, F, um, looking at the hardware, it'd be interesting to know what kind of hardware you're looking at. You know, is it Windows, iPads, Chrome? because it's about um, looking at uh, the curriculum talks about pupils using a, a diverse range of, of um, uh, hardware and basically the word consistency, I just want to make sure consistency doesn't equal uh, one size fits all. Um, uh, so questions around that. Um, just a question around 885 it's actually not a lot of money given what you've put in place and um, is there any costings and pressures on budgets in terms of on costs such as the rental of the lines and everything um, you mentioned that Monmouthshire has done it nobody else because I actually have got a question here around you know 100 megabytes to every single school one gigabyte to the uh, to the secondary schools and I was speaking with some people in Cardiff even Cardiff can't say they've done this. So I'd like to know, what what have you done? What is special about Monmouthshire that's meant that we have managed to... We haven't quite done it yet, as I say, you've got a list of outstanding, but you're feeling confident. So I'd like to know what have we done specifically that we, we can get that infrastructure in, J just given that we were the last um, on the uh, list to, to be connected in phase one through uh, B Team Welsh Government Scheme. 
And then just two generic questions. Um, who is responsible for ensuring that all the equipment is consistent and it's monitored and it's updated and all the staff are trained and supported to use it so that consistency of opportunity throughout the schools uh, is in place? And then the last question, which maybe you can't answer, I think you can't have one without the, you can't have the infrastructure without the learning of how to use it. So using your car analogy, you might have a Ford on the motorway, but you need to teach people to drive that car. Um, and so with that, uh, that's a measurement of the point and the purpose of this infrastructure. So what's the pipeline from primary through to secondary school? How many children have taken up um, computer science, for example, the GCSE, and what's the gender breakdown? How many then went on to do A-levels? How many then went on to do uh, an apprenticeship or jobs in that? So this, who is responsible for monitoring that pipeline um, and, as I say, ensuring that um, schools who aren't using the systems <coughs> Or having that support and training to use it. Thank you. <laughs> Remind me. Okay, um, I'll answer some of these for you. Um, so 3.6a, um, we talk about moving the um, schools to the SRS infrastructure. That's a dedicated education um, infrastructure, so it's not shared with corporate. It's totally separate, which um, allows us to implement things on that infrastructure that aren't tied up with what can or can't be allowed on the corporate infrastructure. The, um, all of the machines within the school need to be connected to something, and this is the something. Um, what it doesn't, it, it does give them um, the ability to use SIMS because that's part of the infrastructure. It also gives them access to internet resources, printing, um, Windows devices, they can use iPads, they can use Chromebooks. So we're not limiting that. In fact, what we're doing is as soon as we receive a request from a school to do something new, we're actually looking at it and saying, well, can we enable that for everybody? If we do it for this one school, what are the opportunities for everybody else? So it's very much about making, I guess, I guess, cheesy or not, but our kind of tagline then, if you like, is doing it once for all schools. So if a school comes in and wants to do BYOD or they want to implement Chromebooks or they want to implement iPads, it's about making sure we can do that for everybody and making it available. Um, schools have got the option to use the cloud. Um, they're very much entitled to do that. And a lot of schools are doing it through in the hub platform. Um, a lot of schools are doing it through Google Chrome, uh, sorry, through um, Google Apps for Education and Google Classroom. That's absolutely fine. I think what we're doing is we're just enabling those things to happen. Um, we have a lot of interaction with Welsh Government around the Hub initiative, making sure that we're fully briefed on what developments are going on and how we can ensure that we're actually suggesting those op opportunities to schools. Um, the Hub platform wasn't particularly taken up that much when it first came in, but schools are using it a lot more now, and it's also increasing... Um, resources available there's lots of tools on there and there's also talk of the adaptive testing being done via hub um, next year so it's very much a platform for wales and we would be totally foolish not to be promoting that so it's totally available for schools and we would be urging them to use it so it's really just having that centralized network that they can connect their devices to um, whether it be the local infrastructure or whether it's BYOD or other forms of Wi-Fi and making sure that we've got the basics in place so we are with those machines are virus protected they do get their updates so they're not susceptible to some of the things that we've seen more recently in terms of the WannaCry um, encryption virus and things like that so it's making sure that by all those with, with all those devices connected to the in infrastructure they are protected from those things and that is one of the things that schools couldn't guarantee when they had their own on-site servers it was dependent on who their support contract was with how knowledgeable they were in some schools it was it was down to what teachers knew or parents knew so you know we've put in something there that hopefully is giving schools a really robust network that we look after and they don't have to worry about it so hopefully that answers that question um, I think the next one was C, wasn't it? 3.8 C? Yeah, yeah, just, can we, can we 
parking ticket corporate capacity? Yeah, so as part of the work that we've done, so we've got the centralised infrastructure and we've got Torvine schools using it as well. So obviously there's a consideration for everybody in a rank capacity. And what we what we do is we regularly monitor that capacity to make sure that we have it. And we have already increased capacity as soon as we as soon as we start to see that creeping up. So that's something that we would continue to do going forward. Again, it shouldn't impact the corporate side because it's a separate network. So it's all funded separately, it's provisioned separately, and we monitor it separately. So any increases to the bandwidth that's required, we monitor that and then we go forward. The, the, the really good thing um, is that the cost of internet bandwidth has come down. Um, so where we were currently paying a set fee for that bandwidth, rather than giving schools a refund, we've given them more capacity. So they actually get more now than they would have done for the same money. So we have to do that because we don't, with more and more apps becoming internet enabled, um, that can't be the bottleneck. So we're, so we're monitoring that as we, as we go along. Um, which one? You've already next? answered the variety bit. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and ongoing costs really yes I, I, um, under the SLA arrangement um, we charged um, three different charges one charge for comprehensive schools uh, who use a lot of equipment and a lot of the SRS services one for medium level schools and one for very small schools within that charge um, that SLA charge is, is the, it covers the cost of the broadband line provision it covers the cost of licenses for um, uh, email and uh, sort of use of word and excel and things like that it covers um, the cost of the four technicians that wander around the schools repairing things it's um it covers, it covers our back-end infrastructure team as well so yes. historically um schools were supported by corporate teams so um the pressure there was that whatever corporate priority came in meant schools got bumped down the list that was a real frustration for schools and it was also very frustrating for us as an education team because you could never seem to penetrate the priorities that corporate need had to be able to get schools issues resolved so working with torvine and monmouthshire um, we agreed funding a couple of years ago to provision a dedicated infrastructure team. So there's now a back-end dedicated infrastructure team of server and network people um, and SIMs who only work for schools. So those corporate, I guess the, the priorities for us now is which school gets something before the next school rather than um, the corporate payroll system is prioritised over schools being able to deliver teaching and learning. So we've made that separation. The really good thing about it is that I can see that it works so well. And when we, when the new partners have come in, so when Blind and Gwent have come in and Newport have come in, it feels very, excuse the pun, it feels very old school in the way that they're operating their services. And we very much want them to consider the centralised infrastructure team that we've got because we think that will also improve services for those schools as well. I think it's important to note here that because we've got delegated budgets for schools, um, any equipment that they purchase in the future is up to them. Previously, the level of support from the SRS technicians was unsustainable because the schools had such old and outdated equipment that we couldn't possibly um, support that with those two technicians. Now that we've refreshed their equipment, upgraded it, updated it, updated their Wi-Fi services, updated everything that they've got, it's now absolutely paramount that each school maintains the level of that equipment and the rather than just let it <coughs> just die away now um, I'm not sure whether schools are fully aware of the fact that well, we've made it made them fully aware that they need to upgrade their equipment on a routine basis but I'm still not sure whether that's um, permeated the minds of all yeah. schools. We'll help with that because as part of this pro process, what we've been doing is giving schools an audit of all their equipment so that they know at this point going forward what they've got. The plan um, as part of the SLA is to do an audit every year and we would rag that. So we would red, amber, green it based on a set of criteria. So a school is very clear that if they have anything that's fallen within a red category, 
um, we class that as not economically viable. So if that piece of equipment breaks down, then it's not economical to kind of fix it because it might be, you know, in some schools that equipment could be 10 years old. The cost of parts might not exist. The actual cost of replacing them might not be comparable in, in a, compared to a new piece of equipment. Anything amber would be um, something that is still serviceable, but it's kind of on the edge. And anything green might still be in warranty parts or available. So we, we, we hope that in doing that kind of assessment, schools will have a very clear picture of what they would need to budget for for that year. And if we can provide that audit year on year on year, where schools are not replacing equipment, that problem is going to get bigger. Um, but there's an opportunity for schools to manage that within their budgets. You know, we recognise that that is difficult, but by giving them as much information as possible, I guess, um, you know, we can't do any more than that. We can't fund the equipment and replace equipment for them, but we can certainly give them as much information as possible to help them make those decisions. And we're always available to meet with schools and go through any budget and any any spend decisions that they want they need help with we're happy to do that and we do that now in forms of account management with with schools so we're more than happy to do that <clears throat> i think you, you <clears throat> excuse me i got a problem in my throat this morning you mentioned the 885,000 is is not a lot of money it we fully costed it out as part of the business case so it came as no surprise that we were actually slightly under budget, in fact, weren't we? Mm. Um, the biggest part of that budget went on employing four technicians to actually do the work, to go in, replace the equipment, to, to migrate the servers from the schools up into the SRS. Um, a lot of that money went on upgrading the um, broadband lines to 100 meg. Since we've actually done this though welsh government have stepped in and their aspiration is for all schools to have 100 meg lines um and they are starting to fund some of this yeah um i guess it's one of the victims of we're the victims of our own success in that sense you know we needed to we needed to solve this problem for monmouthshire schools some of them might have only been on two meg so it just wasn't feasible for them to run you know with the demands of the curriculum and the and the digital competence framework and the need for collaborative tools and things like that it was never going you know we, we had to do something so it's unfortunate <coughs> that Welsh government now are in a position to be able to fund some schools and it's not all schools it is only some schools based on a set of criteria in Wales, or in in Wales, Wales, Wales so yeah we've done it ourselves yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but if it's any consolation, Torvine followed Monmouthshire's lead with the 100 meg line upgrade, so they were in the same boat as well. <laughs> They're ahead of the game, but they've missed out on the funding. Actually, it was to our advantage um, because to enable us to have the SLA properly funded with the proper level of support to schools, we required all schools to sign up. If all schools didn't sign up, we weren't going to spend the 885,000. It wasn't sustainable. So all schools did sign up with the exception of three. Yeah. Um, but it was still felt that with, even without those three schools, it was sustainable. Um, those three schools obviously didn't benefit from the upgrades and, and the investment programme, but they were able to take advantage of the um, government the funding, funding yeah. to actually upgrade their broadband to 100 meg, and that's, that's only happened in the last couple of weeks. Oh, okay. So, whereas, yeah, yeah. And, and to be fair, the average um, installation for the 100 meg lines was around about £5,000 with digging up the roads and things like that. I th some of them were less than that. The, when, when we had the quotes from PSBA for the work, <coughs> there was a discount that was applied. So there were a lot of schools that didn't pay anything. The discount was around £3,000. So it worked, I think it worked out maybe about two to £3,000 for the, for schools who did have to pay. There were, they were one or two that was, I think there was one that was seven grand. Um, but... But it did mean that with that 3,000, that was where we made some saving because this 3,000 pound discount came into play. So there were some schools that didn't incur any charges. Um, okay. Did that answer all your questions? I'm just going to ask that now. Um, I, I think pretty much so. I've got a couple, but others may ask those questions. So I'll, I'll, I'm happy at the moment. Yeah, that's great. Okay, thank you. Councillor Figgins. Thank you. Um, 
I think it's admirable that you've rolled out such a big scheme and got it in time and on budget because it's a complicated scheme. I can see that. Um, one of my no concerns, but I want just a question for you is um, bandwidth. <coughs> Obviously, you, you've created fantastic nodes, um, and now we're asking each of those nodes to come back to and be connected to Urban Oven, and where we need to make sure that there's adequate bandwidth connecting that up, there's adequate redundancy within that network, um, and that the, uh, the the switches and everything in line for that whole system is adequate enough to support the present mm -hmm. infrastructure, but also the, the future infrastructure. We've got to keep our eye on that on that very clearly. Um, the other thing is that we've, we've sort of shepherded all these schools in one direction and we're very much committed to delivering this model now for all the schools to be connected in this way, which is great and fantastic in the way forward. Um, but there are obviously constraints with the service providers, as in BT, I'm guessing, largely, um, that we need to make sure that we're not constricted to, and maybe this is a Welsh Government thing that, that allows you more flexibility with that, but making sure that we're not restricted to <laughs> contracts which are, are penalising um, our preferred approach. Um, so, so that's a sort of general sort of, sort of questions on bandwidth. Um, but then on capacity itself, are we contracted to a set amount of bandwidth uh, over the year? Uh, and obviously if that's divided, you know, over the year, there's many months within the year where we're not using that capacity for school holidays and Christmas holidays, etc. Um, are we able to sell that capacity back to the open market? Oh, now that's interesting. <laughs> um, at the moment, I, d I don't think so, um, but I can certainly find out about that and see what options there are, if there are any. Um, I guess, as I said earlier, one of the things that we're doing mm. is obviously mm. monitoring that bandwidth and ensuring that we've got the capacity there. The infrastructure itself is is fully resilient. Um, there's a lot of work that's taken place over the past five years to ensure that if something goes down, it has minimal impact on schools. Um, just to give an example um, of where we've come from, when we first took over the SLAs for schools, we did have a secondary school in Monmouthshire who just accepted that their email didn't work on weekends because their server fell over, and that's just how it was. Um, you know, I'm really proud to say that we've moved from that so much that now if it's down for 20 seconds we get a phone call and it's the end of the world so you know it, it just shows that we've got that resilience within the infrastructure to minimize disruption as much as we possibly can we and you know all of our all of the servers are um they they run in like a failover so if one fails another one takes over we've just purchased new storage so we're always looking at the infrastructure and where it needs to be invested in to keep it current but we're also looking at what cloud opportunities there are as well because there are some benefits and possibly financial savings in there and, and we would be foolish not to look into those and and make sure that we capitalize on them so i think strategically there's an awful lot on our horizon that we need to look at and make sure that it keeps the infrastructure sound for schools um as other authorities are coming in they're also quite keen to examine what we've done because even though it's centralized it's also managed and it's and it's resilient so i think where schools are struggling with some of that in their in their current infrastructures, they're seeing this as a positive step. So, if some some schools don't like the word centralisation because it says that they're not in control, but I think what we want to do is make sure that you know schools have some element of input in what they want to achieve and making sure that they only come into it if if we can achieve what it is they want you know it's not in mummish's case it's it was kind of this was the offering but in other authorities it might not be mandated but it's there as an op option if they want to take it and we're very much exploring some of that so in terms of the resilience of the system i'm confident that we've got that built in and we're constantly reviewing it as well but i will ask the question about the bandwidth because I'm, I'm not i don't know the answer to that one are you happy with that, Councillor Feekins? Yep, OK. Councillor Becker? Well, first of all, I'd like to say a massive well-blooming done. I come from an IT background, and even the simplest challenge can turn into the most monstrous debacle very quickly. So you must have seriously herded some kittens to get this done in the way that you have. And I think we'd all be very interested to know how you got BT and Open Reach to actually achieve anything on time. Um, 
I have a couple of questions about how we plug into, or how you plug into the responsibilities in, in other areas. So I'm very pleased that you've got a rolling audit system uh, to stop us find, falling off this sort of cliff edge of obsolescence again. Is that something that is um, prescribed by you, or do you wait for invite from the school? The, um, the plan is that we'll start it every April, so it will be an annual piece of work that we do as part of the SLA delivery because um, that way we know we know that schools will have it land on their, right. their inbox as opposed to maybe it won't feature on school's agenda and things will get missed. So we very much prefer to be in control of that and preempt those conversations rather yeah. than wait for them to happen. And that was what I was hoping you'd say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, these things do get shuffled to the bottom of genders, don't they? Um, and also, when you drew a clear line between the sort of uh, the uh, learning requirements and the uh, learning strategy in schools and the um, provision of the broadband, for instance, that you said, and the hardware, how do you actually interface with that learning need, though? Because... You know, in order to provide hardware that's appropriate for the tasks that they're trying to achieve, obviously you have to be aware of what the tasks are that they're trying to achieve and where they might be missing out in, in how they're trying to do it. You know, so. I think um, one of the main drivers within the team is making sure that we meet with schools and understand what they're trying to achieve. So historically, we've come from um, situations where schools have ordered... Well, iPads are a really good example, actually. Schools have ordered... Um, 20 iPads because the school next door did it mm. and when you go into school and then say right okay what do you want to do with them they say well I don't know they did it down the road and it looked like a good idea so what we've tried to do over the last couple of years is is kind of get in on that conversation before the purchase is made so that we can check off any infrastructure complexities that might occur or, or things that work that we might need to schedule in to accommodate what they're trying to do I guess from a from a primary perspective um, a lot of the applications that schools are using these days are, are web-based. So the spec of the device becomes a little less of a problem. You know, the, the technology that we're looking at for schools, we tend to look at it obviously on spec, but also about how robust it is in the classroom. So what we purchase for corporate might not be as resilient in the classroom for schools. So we tend to get things in on demo and we... Don't, don't really drop them, but we just try and do things like prize keys off and just make sure they're resilient, you know, what cases are available, that kind of thing. Um, so we're try, we try and make sure that the, the, the equipment is as relevant, but we also take feedback from schools. So if they purchased equipment and it really was not up to the expectation that they were the standard that they were expecting or they had problems with it, then we would go back to the manufacturer on that and we would also maybe look at a different alternative for next time rather than keep buying the same product that's going to fail. So, um, so we do try and do as much of that R&D as we can, have the conversation with schools about what it is that they want um, and usually, usually that conversation helps them because maybe the plan that they had isn't quite the plan that they then finish up with. But it's just about working with schools, really, and, and trying to get what they need. In a secondary capacity, it is, it is different because schools um, who operate IT suites, for example, need higher end machines um, that maybe need to do more. They need to have local software installed. And again, it's just working with schools to find maybe a machine on test that they can do some testing with first. But before we make that big commitment to purchasing 50 of them, you know, and then find that they're not, they don't meet the needs. So it's using our knowledge, but also working with the schools to understand what it is they're trying to do before they put the purchase order in. Okay. So it's, essentially your point of contact is the, uh, is the school. You don't take any kind of cue from any policy making to do with education. It's all about responding to the, what the school thinks it needs. Yeah. yeah. I think that um, this is edging on to a, a question that Councillor Blakeborough asked earlier on. Um, how do we make sure that, that we provide the platform, <coughs> the infrastructure and the way for schools to actually um, work <coughs> terrible, di fro frog my throat, um, digitally? The digital teaching and learning standards are not something that the mm. SRS deliver. That's something which Welsh Government delivers. Sure. They've got standards in place now for the actual children 
If you're aged eight, you come up with this capability. If you're aged nine, you come up with a different capability. That's I what th- I sometimes I, I is there any cue us, taken from there. We are really keen now to um, enter into the realms of, uh, or for me, in, in, in my role as head, head of digital, not for the SRS, who are uh, technical people, is ha- in making sure that our school teachers have a, some idea of a digital strategy in their school. What, what is it they're trying to achieve? Yeah. Um, how are they going to teach and learn in a digital world? How are they going to sort of share their school um, technology with other schools? You know, what's stopping them from sharing lessons with people in China? Yeah. All of that is something which our Education Achievement Service, the EAS, are trying to do with schools. They are going into schools now and trying to um, coach out how they can t- teach and learn in a d- digital world. We are providing the platform for the schools to actually dive into the water and swim. Sure. Um, and th- that's a, the actual way that they do, do that in schools is slightly outside the scope of this project, but obviously it has to dovetail in mm. because yes, if um, a school's strategy is to use a certain bit of equipment or a certain um, methodology or a certain process, then we have to rise to the expectations in providing the platform for that. But the actual way that they teach and learn is a, a, in a different area. Okay, does that make sense? Yes, it does, and, that, just, and it's uh, just, excellent. I've only got one last thing. I just wanted to add to that so, what Sean said, sorry. That's right. um, one of the things that I've been really keen to do in, in the ro- my role within um, looking after schools is understanding the initiatives that are out there. So I'm a school governor myself. So, you know, it's in my interest to know what's going on in my son's school. So I try to ensure that um, any any learning events that are taking place with, with strategy of schools and curriculum reform and things like that are all being talked about. We're in, we're in that conversation so that we have at least a bit more of an understanding when we're liaising with head teachers. So we're not just technical people going in there trying to baffle them with science. It's it's trying to understand what the pressures are, where where the education, or the curriculum is changing, things like successful futures and the DCF and what that impact that has. As. so we're basing our advice on the knowledge that we've got as well so we're not just techies going in saying yeah you need 20 of those you know we're trying to be a bit more than that it's all balm to my geek soul very much <laughs> um in terms of extra capacity if there is any um other than taking it back to the open market um you've run some hundred meg lines into some rural areas um has anybody uh, raised the idea of using some of that capacity for those communities I know they would say no. <coughs> I'm not interested in what BT is saying. I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer this one because I know yeah. that they, we, we received communication from, I think it was Welsh Government, wasn't it, about um, having some sort of grant funding for schools in rural areas where the actual community could, could benefit from them running oh, those okay. lines in, in, in place, you know, mm-hmm. because a lot of our communities don't have that broadband capacity. Um, we didn't actually need to do that for our schools because we've mm. already already done it. But you know, and unfortunately, th- that that came in a little bit late for us. I'm not sure whether you can elaborate on that, Winsor. Just remind me. What, sorry, just ask the question again because I didn't catch the end of well, it. Well, has there been any um, thought to how the communities that you've uh, run these lines into might be able to benefit from them? So right, could they okay. plug in yeah, to yeah. the hundred meg line that you've? Uh, yeah, I guess um, the way that the lines have been installed, they're using PSBA, which is um, part of an all Wales strategy for for broadband. What what I don't know is how easy it is to kind of piggyback onto it but we can certainly ask that question we can ask the the account managers on that and see what they they come back with because i do know that bt told welsh government because confidentiality that's not possible right we do know around the world it does right and from a purely techie point of view that sounds like nonsense (laughs) we're not allowed to use the psba networks to connect anybody else into you know because of security concerns however i think that the intention was where they were digging up the roads and putting the fiber in place they wouldn't necessarily be using our network but it would certainly be of a benefit to those communities uh, where that actual fibre has gone to the cabinet or wherever it is yeah. that they do. Uh, as part of the project, obviously, enabling those exchanges would have needed to take place as part of the 21st century network upgrade by PSBA. So I guess it's 
it's getting, as Sean said earlier, the motorways there is getting the B road sorted to mm. enable that. But certainly the cabinets would be upgraded now, whereas they may not have been previously. Okay. It's all great. You Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah brilliant. Yeah. I'm, I'm very, more than Councillor happy. Davis and then Councillor Devi. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to add my congratulations to uh, getting your project in on time and in budget and having to work with a certain well-known telecommunications company who we all have some experience of it is a remarkable achievement, in my opinion. I I'm very pleased to see that you've looked very closely at the post-project provision for the schools because uh, undoubtedly, you know, the technology will be increasingly used by educationalists. Um, uh, my question is, are you happy that you have the capacity within that service provision to deal with what what you have now and what may be happening in the future in terms of you know, you, there, there will be more and more use of technology within the educational environment and have we got the capacity to cope with that? Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm just going to, just going back to the BT um, PSBA question, um, we... We, we dealt with B BT because we knew how difficult they were going to be. So we actually had a dedicated project manager who was at the end of the phone for us and we um, had weekly update meetings with him. So the good thing was that when there was a problem, we were able to flag it up and start snapping his, his heels at earliest opportunity. So that didn't, didn't take out all of the delays, but it certainly gave us a feeling that um, if something didn't happen, we knew who we could shout at, which isn't always what you get with BT. So... Um, it wasn't easy, but we did have we did have a very formal process in place to make sure that things didn't go on for months and months and months, um, as we know can happen. So I'm really pleased that we had that arrangement in place. Um, in terms of capacity, you know we have to review that all the time to make sure that it is it is going to be able to support what it is we want it to do. As we currently speak, yes, we do have that capacity. I think the key for us is making sure we monitor it and where we feel that we're reaching thresholds, the infrastructure is reviewed to ensure that we can continue to go forward with it. I think if I was to say we've got capacity now for 10 years, how would I know that? Because we don't know what the picture is going to look like and how things are going to change as we go on. But I think I just need to, um, I, you know, I just want to reassure that we're always going to be monitoring that because we don't want schools to go anywhere else. We want them to stay with the service that we have and we have to make sure that as schools move forward we move forward ahead of them so that they can move forward at the, at the rate that they want to thank you for that <laughs> i'm doing well today <laughs> councillor Devi. thank you chairman um I, I, i'm really pleased jazz uh, raised the uh, point that having got cables into some of these areas where BT, in another world, if you like, are loath to do anything. It, it just does go to show that it isn't beyond their wit to actually uh, uh, put these cables in and it would be a real feather on our cap, in our cap as a county, if we were seen at the same time as uh, in introducing these facilities into our rural schools, we tr tried to make some way the access to broadband accessible to the public there um, that are uh, not enjoying it, and people that actually want to live or run businesses from, from those sort of areas. So I know that isn't your responsibility, but I do think it is a word to be had in another place to see if uh, this is, a, is an idea um, that, can, that can be de developed. I think it would be really good. And it might um, prove to be the crack in the edifice of BT, which will, which will make uh, them take a little more notice of it. The the having said that the the issues that really got uh, I wanted to raise were ones that relate a mountain to Mountain House School, and I declared that I was past chairman of there, so you know an interest there. We had at Mountain House School terrible trouble with IT d uh, down there, and it wasn't only. Um, just the get in the service there it was also the the hardware that we 
provided for them to use, if you like, because it is a really very specialised service. Have you any input into the hardware that is going in there now, or are you providing, if you don't want to do it, providing guidance for them to go? Because they are, this school is the only one in South East Wales, maybe in South Wales in general. And it, it has a potential, if we can do this properly, of making that school far more successful and more attractive to other, other counties. That was the one point I wanted to raise. Um, with regard, you did say Mountain House School and they had to uh, go down a rugged track. You can almost imagine the Wild West with wagons and everything <coughs> else. Well, I, I think you better pick a different one because it's part of an estate down there where the houses are worth about a half a million pound. And I don't think they'd want to be at the end of a wagon train route, if, 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 if you like. Uh, but the, the point is, um, the way it was, uh, the service was provided before was uh, by aerial. It's definitely now in the ground. Brilliant. Um, and the only other point I would ask is the, the issue with having got all this, um, having provided the, uh, uh, the uh, cable, etc., and the uh, equipment that is going in, um, are we encouraging the schools to have somebody like an IT champion within the staff, whatever, because um, if you have problems with the equipment and the call on the centre is um, become the, the level of the calls on the centre become too heavy, then it will reduce the effectiveness of the service that we're trying to provide at the centre. So if, if if it can be cut off at the use this analogy at the we cut it off at the uh, ravine, if you like. Um, if we could do that there by providing um, more uh, trained staff to be able to solve their own problems, I think it would be um, a good thing. I, and I think that's me other than to say, brilliant, <coughs> excellent. Okay, well uh, as far as, far as um, I, the resolution of IT issues in schools, schools have got IT coordinators. Um, one of the things that we found when we were discussing with schools, there was an awful lot of responsibility on those IT coordinators mm -hmm. because they were collating all of the IT issues for everybody else within the school. Um, we would receive a fault sheet with all the issues on. Sometimes it wouldn't have all the issues and sometimes we'd go away not resolving all of the problems that existed. So what we did was introduce a call logging system, which is web-based, um, and a lot of schools were really... Um, really encouraged by the fact that individuals could log their own calls rather than it be the responsibility of one IT coordinator. Now we've been running that system for the past 12 months and we've provided training to staff so that they know how to use it and where there's been um, not as much uptake within schools we've gone back out and we've retrained staff to use it so we're really trying to be as persistent as possible on that one. Um, we've got technicians now, we've got a technician per cluster, so if there is an issue within the cluster, there is somebody who can respond to it fairly quickly. Chepstow is a very good example because all the schools are very close together, so if there is a problem, the engineer there can get to schools quite, quite quickly. Obviously, it's a little bit more time-consuming with other clusters because they're a little bit further apart. Um, what we find now, though, is because the system has been centralised as such, problems that exist tend to be the same. Um, so once we've resolved it for one, we can quickly resolve it for another. Um, we've, we've got a lot of access to remote tools, so if schools have got an issue we haven't necessarily got to visit. We may be able to resolve that remotely the same day. And technicians do spend a day when they're on SLA. They spend the entire day at the school to make sure that they can pick up any issues that are outstanding. Um, when I 
worked in Monmouthshire. I worked with Sean on on the project to enable the tech, um, the change of technology and agile on the corporate side. And one of the things that we found in doing that project was we were enabling staff with better bits of equipment and more reliable bits of equipment that allow that allowed our officers not to we were worried about the old the old issues that they used to have but actually now that I've got a sound piece of equipment what can I do next and we feel that that's where we are with schools now they're not hopefully they shouldn't need to be worrying about old versions of operating system and windows xp and incompatible software that should be sound now and they should be allowed the time to focus on okay now we've got this running and we can rely on it and we've got confidence in it what can we do next so i think you know the the proof will be over the next 12 months really as to whether we achieve that because it's from at this point forward that all schools will be using it in that way but i but having been here before i think we will see a very similar pattern and and we've we've enabled schools to think about what they can do next rather than going back to the same problem that they've always had because the equipment just wasn't up to up to scratch and that's where it's important that schools factor in their rolling program for equipment refresh because if they don't do that then they're going to put themselves back in that position and we really don't want that because we will be we will be starting again and there may not be the funding to do it next time Um, I th- think that's great. Um, the one thing that uh, you we, you were talking about um, uh, uh, repeated problems. Um, I, it, is there a facility within um, the system whereby, if you uh, notice that there is a repeated problem coming through, then you let the um, the whole of the network know that this is a problem. This is the solution, and they can diarise that if you like. So you you cut off the need to for a technician at the centre. I'm I'm a bit of a luddite. I don't talk in in Jez's language, you know. Um, but it, uh, it you can cut off the the problem because you've let all schools know that there is this thing, and this is just what you do, and that reduces the pressure on the center all the, t- all the time yeah I, I guess i guess it's going to depend on the type of problem um you know we we do try and send out regular newsletters to schools and we also have an alert service so if there is a system issue we let schools know what it is i guess if it's a recurring system within a school so if it's to do with a piece of aging hardware then that is kind of school specific. But if there was something that was more general, then yeah, we would yeah we would make sure that that message gets out to schools via a newsletter or an alert, or even via technicians themselves. Um, but again, I guess the important thing for us is if schools are having repeated problems that we're not aware of, we can pick those up when we meet with schools anyway. And and I think the important thing is schools know that they can ask us for that meeting as well as us initiating that meeting. You know, we want to be really open with that. Yeah, and just to go back to the mountain house one, sorry, I, d- I didn't want to leave that one off. Um, we have we have managed to get the hundred meg line upgrade to mountain house, which um, has been a bit of an achievement, really. And as you all know, it's it's been historically very problematic. Um, that line is due to go live now in the summer holidays because we need to do a migration for them, and because it is such a specialist school we felt it was easier to do the two parts of the project at the same time when the school is closed rather than what we've done with other schools where we've been able to do some of it while the school is open. So we've been having a conversation with um, staff on site there about how we facilitate that. One of the things, though, that we have found with that project um, is that a lot of the equipment on site has been recently replaced. So it, it is of so I don't know if something has changed more recently um, since you've been there, but the equipment seems to be very much up to spec. So we don't see that as being a problem. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I think I, I don't. Perhaps it's not as big a problem at this point as maybe it was previously. But we're certainly seeing that there's a lot of good kit there. So we haven't flagged out many issues up with that site at all. I think that really good news. It's the first time Mountain House has been a first for anything in my memory. Anyway, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Deputy Councillor Blakeborough. Thanks. 
just a last couple, because I'm aware we've been an hour on this, so we've really <laughs> scrutinised it. Um, <coughs> Um, it's really just getting down to the rules and responsibilities and um, SRS is responsible for setting up the platform and for the IT support throughout uh, Monmouthshire schools, making sure the hardware is in place, you've got the team doing that, making all that's connected. The curriculum size, you're saying it's EAS who is responsible for doing that. Just want to ask what then is the responsibility and the accountability of the local authority to make sure all this does work? And who is responsible for measuring the outcomes of, of, of this being in place um, in terms of numbers, you know, taking up certain subjects, going on to it in the future? And then I was, I, I, this may not be the, the, the right place, and, and Hazel, you might be able to help, but I'm really keen on looking at the pipeline of development from primary to secondary through to apprenticeships and jobs and measurement of, is, again, the gender is a uh, balance is, is an issue for me and I don't know where because if that's not working then all this infrastructure waste time really um, so where where it would be good to maybe scrutinize that look maybe it's a joint committee I don't know I think it would be joint between yourselves and CYP um, CYP because you've jointly scrutinized um, the sort of digital learning curriculum side with them before you did that last year but for new members that would be of benefit but also because the apprentice program sits under this committee so I think in terms of the infrastructure and apprentice it's relevant that it sits under this committee, but I think you need that CYP input. So I would say something jointly. And they've recently had their meeting and they suggested they'd like to look at ICT sort of curriculum side. So it would definitely be a worthy joint scrutiny item. If I could come back to you on the responsibilities, <coughs> the responsibilities side, um, we have a performance monitoring for the actual technical side. Um, some of the... Um, capacity, some of the funding for the ICT provision um, rests with central education. They have to provide an internet connection. Um, and the three schools that are outside of the SRS SLA arrangement, they receive an internet connection, but they commission pr private providers to do everything that the SRS does. <clears throat> in, the, um, in the event that anything goes wrong, We've got an escalation process for the SLA. Um, the escalation process comes up through me uh, because I monitor <coughs> the SRS's performance in this SLA um, and it's also monitored by central education. We're going to set up um, a, a sort of user working group um, in the same way as Torvine currently have, one where we have um, certain selected head teachers who attend along with a representative from the Education Authority, possibly um, Nikki Wellington or uh, possibly Will McLean uh, and myself, so that we regularly meet with them once a quarter to see how this is, um, this is actually put into place. I, like you, want to see the outcomes in terms of whether our children are coming through the education service with a better level of digital competency than they previously have. Um, we can certainly measure whether the systems and processes and the ICT in the schools are working more effectively and how effectively the SRS respond to problems so the schools don't have to think about ICT platforms and provision they can only only need to think about how they deal with things in the education curriculum teaching and learning center um, uh, along with simon nevesy who was uh, in charge of the buildings so you've got the srs in charge of the software systems and the wires and whistles and bells that sort of connect to our machines simon nevesy is dealing with the buildings the new buildings in 21st century schools and how all of that connectivity is going into the new schools. Um, we've also liaised with some of the head teachers, and we are very keen to um, have a, a form of a conference going forward now in the, the new school, school term um, with technical representatives, buildings representatives, representatives from the EAS with Will McLean and perhaps some education specialists in digital, digital teaching and learning and curriculum. 
um, so that we could start the ball rolling to make sure that uh, they're using this newly um, provisioned platform to the benefit of the actual school children then onwards into the digital economies in Wales. Okay. Councillor Feekins. Thanks. I uh, just back to broadband, sorry, uh, bandwidth. Um, I understand that you've put 100 megabits into each school, into each place. Obviously, there's one school with 200 students. 200 students are sharing 100 megabits. If you've got a school with 400 students, you've got 400 students sharing 100 megabits. Um, so I understand that my next question is a little bit difficult to answer, understanding that how internet traffic is handled over through switches and over um, uh, bandwidth. Um, but do we know uh, what sort of headroom over capacity we have? And obviously, I'm guessing that's going to change in different areas. And is now an opportunity to go back to Welsh Government and say, well, look, we know where we're short. You know, we've got a school with 400 pupils in. We know what we're short on capacity in that area, on headroom, compared to the school with 200 pupils in. So is now an opportunity to, to have a sort of, or to start thinking about a phase two, more on the bandwidth side than on the deployment within the schools? OK. Um, one of the problems that we had when all schools were on 10 meg was that they were all at capacity and what we couldn't tell was how much over that capacity they were. So all we knew was the performance was failing within the school, but we couldn't tell by how much because they were just hitting that headroom all the time. What we are able to do now is monitor those lines, just like we do with the internet capacity, monitor those lines to see how well those lines are performing. If a school's got 400 children in it, but only 20 laptops, it's going to perform the same as a school with, 20, with, with 200 pupils with 200 laptops. You know, I guess it doesn't really matter how big the school is, it's how much kit they're using, what they're using it for. So we're able to provide um, capacity maps, um, which in Torvine we've agreed to provide it to schools on a quarterly basis so that they can look themselves as to where their capacity is. Um, and there's no reason why we can't do the same thing um, in Monmouthshire. I guess I've just not thought about it until now. <laughs> um, so that would allow us to look at schools and see whether there is a, a problem emerging. One of the things that we are able to do is um, find out what's using that capacity. So one of the things that we've done um, on the centralised infrastructure, so it's a problem that was identified in Torvine, but we can now actually fix for everybody, is looking at the iPads and how they're, they're managed. So all iPads are currently managed centrally through, a, through an application. But what, what, what's not happening is um, there isn't anything managing how those apps are being downloaded. So at the moment, if 20 iPads download an app, they're all pulling bandwidth. So what we've been doing is looking at putting in um, caching servers. So that will allow the school to download that app once to that local server and then serve it locally to all their iPads as opposed to 20 of those iPads trying to get it at the same time. So I guess the important thing for us is that we're looking to see where schools are using bandwidth and how we can how we can identify what's using it and whether there's something we can put in there to mitigate against it. If we don't do those things, then schools are going to be looking at, okay, what's my next upgrade? What's my next upgrade? And, and actually, there's a problem that we possibly can solve. So I think by giving schools the um, capacity maps of what they're using, it'll also allow them to forward plan. It might not be a one-size-fits-all upgrade. It might be that some schools are just more technology rich than others or they're using it in different ways. So I think it's about, again, us monitoring that process and making sure we feed back to schools where their capacity is and, and what it looks like and if there's potential fixes, how we can fix it. I guess with the um, Apple example, that may be a cost to the school to put something in place, hardware on their network. But if you balance that to the cost of maybe the line upgrade, it's probably... Uh, you know, a cost worth accepting, but I guess you know we'd have to we'd have to monitor that on a site by site basis. But I think the point is we weren't able to see that headroom before. We can see it now, and we and hopefully you know by giving schools visibility of it, it will allow them to plan ahead. And just just to come back on the one point, then that allows us as a county then to to sort of look at how different schools are using it and to see maybe that might feed into their curriculum to making sure that one school is using uh, and it, uh, something that's heavy on bandwidth in the afternoon and another uses it in the morning just so we have a, a, a better deployment. Yeah, I guess you know it's 
there's, there's lots of tools available to schools, you know, and, and schools are using lots of different technology. So you might have a school that's using Hub all the time, but if they're using it on a laptop, um, the impact of that might be different if they're using it on a Chromebook, which is always connected. So, you know, it'll depend on the technology they're using, how they're using it. If they're using YouTube, that, that's going to have a bigger demand. You know, it, it's kind of the intensity of what they're doing, how many devices they're doing it on, how long for, you know, that all that kind of thing, really. Um, I guess for us you know we've got schools to a position now where their wi-fi is sound and everything's working and i know we've talked about audits for equipment but similarly schools are still going to need to consider their infrastructure going forward as well because that will come with a lifespan so you know we need to make sure that um if and like sean said working with 21st century schools when we're when we're putting those school when when those schools are being built we're making sure we're specifying the most up-to-date technology in those schools so that they can plan ahead you know we're not going to put the same access points in schools in brand new schools as as we have in primary schools because the technology has already changed so we're making sure that we keep that relevant okay um I've, i've just got a couple of questions um i suppose it's in relation to um the audit uh, and understanding current um levels of hardware and, and um in essence some capacity uh, you know as an authority we talk about um you know our vision is you know not to leave anyone behind and equality of opportunity you know i'm, I'm still concerned with delegated budgets there's and i think you touched on there sarah in terms of some schools they're going to be technology rich and and what that even if you have a an excellent um, bespoke digital um, delivery plan within the school. There's still going to be pupils who are going to be deprived because of because of hardware capacity. So, in terms of what you've done with the audit, are you are you saying now you, there's you're satisfied? There's a level um, a, amongst primary schools that, with the technology they they've got, you know that they they can go on and and jump into that pool in, in terms of the analogy that the that, that said um or is there a, you know with your audit are you already looking at sort of amber and red um uh signals in terms of the school needs to upgrade you know pretty shortly um you know because they're not in, in terms of delivering on the on the um dcf by by you know whilst government are looking to have progress on this within a you know within a year 18 months that those some schools are not not going to get there or there's going to be some some impact there and my second my second point it was just in relation to um and i know um sean touched on this in terms of follow-up but the um post um completion review and evaluation and, and what are the time scales for that thank you yeah, um, as part of the recu- equipment refresh, the main aim was to remove all the XP machines. Um, any device that couldn't support Windows 7 needed to go, and that's what we've replaced. What that does mean is there are still machines within schools that are running Windows 7 that function now that will be on that short lifespan. So it does. It's not a. It's not a kind of kickback situation for schools thinking that in three years time, that's when they've got to worry about this. It very much is still now. And that won't just apply to Windows devices. That'll also apply to things like their iPads. You know, iPads have been in school now for about three or four years. Those versions of iPads are coming end of life. Um, We've had schools already looking at a replacement program for those so that they can support latest versions of iOS going forward. Um, so schools are going to need to think about that as well. So it, it, it very much is looking at, looking at what they've got using our audits, but they are going to need to look at that now because there will be equipment on there that will be coming towards end of life because the, the project was to ensure that the equipment met a standard and we've met that standard. It's just making sure that schools refresh that going forward. Just to follow up on that, so in terms of your procurement offer, um, I suppose you, you would have a, a mix of purchase, lease um, to to accommodate whatever the school's budget is, um, and you know whatever they're trying to achieve, as you said, within the within their particular plan. Um, we've had schools ask about leasing arrangements, and that's not something that we particularly um, are experienced in, but. I think there's ways that schools can do it through like a loan scheme through the authority. So um, obviously we can we can offer 
pricing for a diverse range of equipment and um, the benefit to us is that if we have economies of scale we can get that equipment cheaper um, what we've done pre- um, pr- recently is we've actually gone out to schools and said look are you thinking of buying equipment in the next six months and if so let us know how many because we can go out to a mini tender and try and drive that price down um, I've got the other bit so <laughs> The, 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 well, I, I think you've, you've you've sort of covered the the, the first point. And the, the second point was just in relation to the post evaluation oh, review. Um, <laughs> yes, we are going to do a post evaluation review with all of the schools. Um, we we I would like daily to go along to all schools and meet with their governors as well. We are meeting with uh, one school this mm-hmm. evening. Um, it's what we did previously when uh, we, before we actually lo- launched the project, just to make sure that not only the head teachers but also the governors were aware of um, the program and the benefits of the program. Um, for me, I I know that we've successfully implemented some of the lines, upgraded the, the kit. Um, What's more important to me is whether the schools are receiving a better service now. and They don't have to think of the underlying technology. They only need to think about teaching and learning. Um, and for me, that's, that's a successful project. I would dearly love to link that into the competencies of the children coming out of, out of school. I'm not sure how we can do that at this phase. But the post-project evaluation will run immediately now in September prior to the close of the project. And we'll pick up any snagging issues that then at that point. But then going forward, of course, we'll have this new um, um, board of people who are sitting there meeting once a quarter to make sure that that performance level and that standard is still in place. OK. Uh, Councillor Devery, uh, final word? We should address ourselves. Can't do it without turning the button. Yeah, that's a Luddite thing. You've got to keep nudging me. Um, the, uh, we should address ourselves uh, to the camera, if you like, as a community. This is yet and again another example of the Monmouthshire County Council taking the lead in best practice and innovation. And the, um, one finds that other councils and indeed the Welsh Government uh, pick up on it and run with it later on. Uh, so having established who we are and where we are and how good we are, um, uh, can we ex- expect or ask for a fee from the Welsh Government? <laughs> uh, bearing in mind uh, they're getting this information and advice uh, for nothing today. Are we going to get some I retrospective? I wouldn't be doing my job it? if I hadn't already asked that question, <laughs> and, and we did because we felt that um, it was only right. But unfortunately, because all the purchase orders had been submitted, they weren't able to do anything. But I have asked. I did ask that question. <laughs> Okay, if there's no further questions, I think um, we've we've given this a, a really good uh, scrutiny uh, um, session this morning on this particular item. Um, I think it would be obviously great to have the post evaluation review come back here, uh, so we can so we can look at that. Um, but I think from the discussions, I think uh, it, it's obvious that we're going to need a, a joint scrutiny session with um, children and young people to have a look at, you know, the, in terms of the, the teaching and, and, and the, the, the throughputs, I suppose, the input in terms of um, moving from primary to secondary into apprenticeships and how that's going to work for us as a, um, as a, as a county. So I think um, we'll look uh, in our, our further agenda items down in, uh, on today's meeting in terms of how we're shape our forward work program and, 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 and build that in. I think there was two actions from, from the discussions um, to find out about the uh, bandwidth and whether that could be sold to the open market and the other one was about um, rural communities and how they can use the, the capa- potential potentially use the capacity going forward. So if those, um, if those can be um, noted, that would be fantastic. Um, and just to say thank you, Sean, thank you, Sarah. It's a, it is a fantastic uh, project that you've delivered uh, and we look forward to the 
post-evaluation review. So thank you. Okay, uh, move on to agenda item six and call uh, Richard forward. Thank you, Richard. Okay, as um, Richard just needs to set up his presentation, can I um, just propose a, a short recess to allow him to do that? Everyone happy? Okay.
Okay, thank you, councillors. We'll um, restart with um, the next item on, on the agenda, which is item six and performance report 2016-17. Um, I know uh, Richard's going to give us a, a brief presentation on this, um, but just as a background, what normally would happen when performance report would come before us, we would have the um, relevant cabinet member and, and senior officer who we would direct our scrutiny questions to. Um, so just to be mindful that obviously Richard is here uh, as a messenger and he's just going to give us a, a, a flavour of, of, <laughs> of what we should be looking at. Um, more of a training exercise, I suppose, in terms of um, just giving, a, a, giving us a flavour of the framework uh, and how the data is, is set out and some of the areas we, you know, we may like to look at for, for, for scrutiny. Um, there may be some questions in terms of um, the, the shape of the, f the framework uh, after that, but um, whether whether or not we we um, pinpoint any of the, uh, the the data for for scrutiny for those particular areas, um, it may not be pertinent for for, for this particular session. As, as I said, it's more of a training training session. So um, over to you. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, hopefully it's been worth the wait. I'm conscious of time as well, so I'll uh, try and flick through this as quickly as I quickly as I can. Um, by way of introduction, as a policy and performance team, we usually bring two main types of report to the committee um, and regularly routinely planned on your work programme. And those are performance reports, which tend to relate to some of our key strategic policies and strategies. Um, and also then the risk assessment, which looks at how we manage, identify and mitigate strategic risks. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the performance report before you and our performance framework. And as the Chair says, use the opportunity to give you a bit of an introduction to the framework and for exist, uh, previous members of the Council, um, a recap, hopefully, of how the framework works and, and fits together. And our reference as we go through some of the performance reports at Appendix 2 and 3 to show you how those currently fit in. Um, and as the chair says, we usually have the CAM member and chief officer here to answer any specific questions. But if you do have any, um, it may be useful to use this to inform your work programme, which I know you're looking at as the next item on the agenda. Uh, and if there's any technical questions, I will try and endeavour to do my best to answer them as well. So I'm happy to take questions on the framework as we go chair or at the end, whichever whichever is, uh, whichever is best. Just uh, stop me in mid-flow if there's any, any burning questions. So what I'll look to cover today, um, a very brief recap of the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act. I'm sure you've all received training in various parts uh, of your in inductions already, but just quick recap, so we'll mention it quite a lot. I'll then run through the performance management framework and some of the detail that is on Appendix 1 of your papers. And I'll quickly go through the policy framework, which is basically some of the key documents and strategies you will receive as a committee of how we've built up uh, the performance management framework. Where to find out more information, um, I'm sure you're familiar with the Hub, and this is a place where we've stored a lot of resources that will allow you to look at not just guidance, but actually performance and policy documents of the Council on an ongoing basis. So you won't just have to wait for a report to come to the committee. You can actually look on there and look at things like service plans, um, each service is set in, look at our risk assessment, which is updated live. We've got guidance areas around the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act, etc. So I allow you to actually look between meetings at some of the performance issues of the Council and actually use that to inform your work. Uh, rather than just solely relying on the information you receive at, on a six-weekly meeting cycle basis or however your work programme is set out. So the Finance and Performance Management Area Circle Day is the area sort of our, my team um, set up, and that's where you'll find a lot more information about council performance and, and data and plans. So the future, Wellbeing and Future Generations Act, very quickly, um, fundamental legislation from, from Welsh Government requires us to carry out signal development in what we do and look at how we meet the needs of the present without compromising the needs of future generations. Um, in terms of sustainable development, the Act defines what it means by sustainable development as the process of improving the economic, social, environmental and cultural well-being of Wales by taking action in accordance with the sustainable development principle and achieving the well-being goals. And on the screen you can see the well-being goals. Um, and certainly as, as a geographer, I'm very used to when talking about sustainable development, talking about social, economic, environmental sustainability. Um, an important part to remember is that actually cultural well-being and cultural sustainability is actually part of the Act as well. So 
So that's an important point to consider. And in, in terms of how we plan our work, we have to look at how we can, at every opportunity, maximise our contribution to the seven we wellbeing goals you can see on the screen. No. Another part of the Act sets out five ways of working, sometimes called, I think, sustainable governance principles. But the ways of working are there, in terms of any decision we make, how we plan and deliver our service, we've got to consider how we can take account of these five ways of working. So how can we balance short-term needs with long-term needs, use an integrated approach, involve others and take their views into account, work in collaboration, putting resources into preventing problems. And something you will see as a committee as part of when you're scrutinising policy going through to decision by Cabinet or Council is in future generations of evaluations that will be attached to those reports. Services, officers, managers proposing changes will have to evidence how they've taken into account these ways of working and developing that proposal. And it's important that we embed those at the start of the project to make sure we can maximise our consideration of these areas rather than just at the midpoint or at the end. So certainly, uh, as members, areas you'll be particularly, I'm sure, want to challenge in part of your future work programme. An important point to remember, in some cases, we will not be able to contribute to every wellbeing goal, or we will not be able to exactly match every way of working. That doesn't necessarily stop us making that decision, but what we've got to do is evidence that we've actually given that due consideration and that we've given that evidence to those making the decisions that that is the case. So that's very quickly the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Why do we have to do things differently? Um, I'm sure you don't need me to remind you of some of the challenges we face. Um, obviously, the Act, in terms of the Future Generations Act, is also the Social Service and Wellbeing Act, the Environment Act, will place certain requirements on why we have to work differently. But obviously, we've also got various other challenges, which means when I come on now to our performance framework, um, they will have an impact on how we look to plan and deliver services and make how we will look to make changes to that framework to adapt to... Uh, to the way we plan to, to meet them. So when we talk about how we can deal with rising demographic pressures, changes in customer needs and expectations, regulatory changes, etc. So when we're looking at how we can work with communities better, how we plan the long term, our performance framework needs to adapt to that to make sure we're planning in um, our delivery and, and solutions to that in a, in a flexible way. So moving on to, to the framework, um, it's been Commonly described before, I think, as an onion was quite a popular phrase from previous previous select committees, and you probably see the resemblance. I've heard also solar system with planets orbiting around it, but uh, however you want to remember it, um, I'm quite happy as long as you remember the principles of it. So we call it the performance framework rather than the onion. Um, as a council delivering a wide range of services, there's a lot of elements as part of this, but this is how we look to try and simplify and ensure a clear line of sight between the organisation from the individual employee up to our purpose, which you can see there is building sustainable and resilient communities. And the areas around the outside are some of those influences that can obviously mean we need to change and adapt our plans that form part of the part of the framework. So I'll quickly go through the layers, um, layers of the onion if you like. But so starting with purpose of the organisation, building sustainable and resilient communities, um, previous members will be aware that was the purpose sort of over the last few years, it still remains relevant in terms of how we look to improve the economic, social, environmental and cultural well-being in Monmouthshire. And it's basically our goal we focus on as we plan all our services. So I imagine that's a term we'll be using a lot in the future and have been in the past. Public Service Board well-being objectives. Is everyone familiar with Public Service Board and the term Public Service Board? I'll briefly run through it as we go. But, but the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act places a responsibility on specific public bodies to act uh, in a jointly to improve social, economic, environment, and cultural well-being. And to do that, the PSB have to publish well-being objectives um, by, I think it's March 2018. And there's important steps the PSB need to take on that journey to publish in those objectives, one of which has already been, been met. So there's four statutory members of the Public Service Board. We've got the local authority, local health board, fire and rescue service, and also natural resources, and they're statutory. And in Monmouthshire, that board also includes Gwent Police, Monmouthshire Housing Association, Mellon Homes, and also representation of the voluntary sector through GAVRO as well. 
And the PSB have already completed uh, what's called a wellbeing assessment of the county. That was signed off in March 20, 2017, and that was endorsed by the last meeting of the last council in March as, as well. And that assessment looked at analysing social, environmental, cultural and wellbeing in Monmouthshire. It used a range of evidence, policy, research. I know some of you aware of the engagement work that was undertaken at that time around our Monmouthshire, speaking to over 1,400 residents. And that's been used to form some opportunities and challenge statements that the, the Public Service Board are now using to frame some of their objectives. So clearly, once those objectives are set, we all have a role as a council probably in delivering some of those, as well as some of our partners. And we'll look to how then those objectives will influence on our own objectives as a council and our delivery of services and, and in different service plans as well. So that's something that will have a, a big impact on, on our framework once those are set. I was going to show you a video of the wellbeing assessment. For time, I'll probably move on. It's available on the council's um, YouTube channel, and we can circulate a link to it as well. It can. I'll do justice in two minutes, far more than I could in terms of some of the key, key information that's come out of the assessment. But it's easy accessible, and we can send the link round, link round to that. So our council wellbeing objectives, separate to and different to the public service board's wellbeing objectives, or will be it, there may be links um, in terms of crossover to what we're looking to deliver. And as a council, we've got a duty to publish objectives, uh, make a statement to support them, and also then produce an annual report of our progress. And that annual report is likely to, to be something that comes to all select committees. We had to publish them by March 2017. Um, so the last council uh, before the election took the decision to approve the wellbeing objectives for Monmouthshire and there's four of them and these are the four objectives and at the moment you can see they're based around the purpose they have stigmatized Indian communities so it's just a bit small on the screen and the green hasn't come out well but I can circulate these and they're already on our website and I think particularly for, for this committee the objective around developing opportunities for communities and business to ensure well-connected and thriving county is something that you're likely to want to scrutinise and receive further information on. So that objective would be particularly relevant um, to the committee. We're at the stage at the moment where we didn't, in March 2017, have sufficient evidence to publish some of the responses, actions and metrics we'll use to monitor progress under these objectives. So that's something that's going to come back to council in future for you all to hopefully approve and that will form the basis then of future select committee reports in terms of tracking our progress and this is one area where there's been where there will be a big change in terms of how we, information we plan and set and report to you appendix two of the report today looks at our progress in 2016-17 against our improvement objectives we set as a council for that year and the improvement objectives and legislation that underpins it tends to, not always, but tends to focus on some of the more service improvement, marginal changes and improvement in performance we're looking to make on an annual basis. The wellbeing objectives under the Future Generations Act is an encourages look to how we address some of those more longer term challenges we've got in our communities. So in terms of the information and actions we take, they like to be more long term. It's important as members you will still receive information and the work programme discussion I'm sure will be vital to this on service performance and how service is managing demand and performing. But the wellbeing objectives will undoubtedly include some longer term milestones and measures and more population based outcomes that we can track to make sure that the services we're delivering are actually making an impact on some of those those big challenges. So that's a sort of big change from the information receiving today in Appendix 2 to some of the information certainly we as a team are reporting to you in, in, in future. Um, but as I say, the service performance aspect of it remains vital for it. Service planning, I, I mentioned them already. Each of our services uh, develops a plan for the year ahead, looking at how they're going to deliver this service. There's five main parts to that plan. They're all available on the hub for you to look at at any time. They're updated quarterly. And I say that might be a useful source of information for you to inform your scrutiny. And the five things they look at are... Uh, sorry. Evaluating performance, so evaluating what they achieved last year, learning from that, what can they look to improve, make better change in the future. They link, so they link to other plans and strategies, either as part of this framework, either as part of legislation they have to comply with, etc. So it's that plan that draws together all the actions they're, they're looking to take. Um, 
The actions will set out what they look to deliver, time scales, responsibility holders, etc. They will use data then to manage the performance of the service, and that's data around finance, data around staff resources, data around performance, data around demand, etc. on that service. So they use that to track their performance throughout the year. Uh, and then final part of that will be managing and looking to mitigate any risks that uh, pose that service as well. So that plan will contain that information and be updated quarterly by the service available on the hub. Employee aims and objectives. Obviously vitally underpinning all this is each member of, uh, of the council actually understanding where they sit, understanding their contribution, not right up to the vision of, and purpose of building sustainable resilient communities. And in Monmouthshire, the employee appraisal process, also known as check-in, check-out, um, is where those conversations happen with managers about training needs, etc., but also importantly about what are those individual aims and objectives the employee can look to achieve and then ensure, make sure they understand how they contribute to their service plan and also to the wider objectives of the council. So undoubtedly a fundamental part of how the whole, the whole framework hands together. So that's the final layer. So just, oops, sorry, skip ahead. That's the final layer of the, the framework. I just wanted to quickly bring it back together at the end um, and just touch upon some of those um, areas in red and blue around the outside. So obviously there will be different influences on all parts of the framework at different parts of the year. I've touched upon the Public Service Board. Just briefly in terms of Future Monmouthshire, I'm sure many of you have heard of Future Monmouthshire and what it's trying to achieve. And as part of that project, looking about how we can meet the needs of residents, visitors um, and businesses in the county for the longer term. Two pieces of work, looking at the shorter term focus, how we can manage our, manage our budgets and, and plan solutions to that. And the longer term focus about how we keep growing as a council to tackle some of the longer term problems. Clearly, as we look to develop those solutions and they begin to be implemented, those projects and programmes will become embedded in the, in the performance framework, whether that's in our wellbeing objectives, whether that's in our service plans, whether that's linked to what the Public Service Board is doing as a partnership. Uh, across Monmouthshire, so, so that will have an impact and will influence the plans that form under there. Uh, and the, the areas in red are some of the external influences on the framework. So we've got the National Policy Framework, I've touched upon some of those already today. Things like the Future Generations Act, so Service and Wellbeing Act, Environment Act, and there's lots of others and they will impact on individual services, how the whole council operates depending on, on what they are. So we need to consider those in our framework. And then external regulation and inspection, whether that's Wales Audit Office work, ESTIN, um, CSI, CSIW work, they will look and identify areas where we need to, pro need to pro improve our performance, improve our processes, so we need to consider their feedback and their proposals or, or issues within how we plan as well. So that's just a brief run through the framework. In terms of called this policy framework, this is just setting out really some of the actual plans and strategies that are part of it. Um, so some of them what exactly matched here is the framework, wellbeing plan, wellbeing objectives. Um, important layer, third layer down in the strategy, um, often referred to as our enabling strategies. So cover some of our key resources about how we plan to deliver our objectives. Some of them you will be familiar with and some of them you will become familiar with as part of your future work programme, I'm sure. So assets, how we manage our assets to deliver our objectives finances, medium-term financial plan, people strategy, so how we actually look to develop and recruit and retain the people we need to deliver our objectives. iCounty sets out our approach in terms of digital as a council and also in terms of how we're going to develop digital in the county as well, and local development plan in terms of obviously land use, etc. So important range of strategies there. Risk assessment I've mentioned. Um, I've touched on service plans as well and employee aims and objectives. Um, just to mention the chief officer plan level, our chief officers will set out for their areas an overarching plan that will cover um, they, what they see as their key objectives for, for the year ahead. And again, they're like, they will, they will not likely to be, they will need to be strong links to our, our wellbeing objectives, the PSB wellbeing objectives, and also then how services align and deliver to those as well. And I think the Chief Officer Report Social Green Health is, is, is imminently um, due to be completed. And I know the Chief Officer of Children and People uh, completed one last, I think last December as well. So you will see those, and that's where they fit in our framework. Um, 
Another important element to touch on, and finally, you'll be pleased to know, is the performance measures area. You can see you've got it running down the side there, and that's deliberate because obviously performance measurement, how we manage our performance and use data, is relevant to all those areas of work. Um, today on your report, you'll see Appendix 3, which contains just one set of measures. So that's our national performance measures that we report to you as a central policy and performance team. Uh, but please, the council, we've got a range of different performance frameworks we're a part of nationally, which we have to report on. And also we will develop locally based measures which will allow us to evaluate our progress against these range of strategies. So that is a cross-cutting piece of work that will, will impact on all those levels. And we're particularly looking as a team at how we can really strengthen that and our use of data to inform our, inform our strategic planning um, going forward. So Appendix 3 will just, is just one set of those measures. Um, and what sort of information should you be looking for? And again, this is just one example of presentation, but I think it covers some key points you as committee in performance reports and in other reports you will see we're looking, looking out for. How can you compare performance over years? So we're looking at trend data over time as well as actual current performance. How you can compare performance against targets, and you may look to challenge about some of those targets and how they're set and are they stretching enough or not. Uh, an important one which we can't do at the moment for 1617s, the data we published in September, is how our performance compares to other areas. So we've got a framework in place that allows uh, comparison on a certain set of measures at a Wales wide basis, and other services will have individual uh, frameworks that allow them to do that as well. Um, but also where we can, how we can we look to compare ourselves, not just with Wales, but in terms of wider UK and national comparators. Not always, not always easy when we're get, looking at getting actual comparable data in place, but important. So that's sort of some of the information we'll report to you and, you, and I know you'll be looking out for in, in future reports. So that concludes the run through of the framework. I've touched upon, Chair, sort of where the reports you've got and the appendix, appendices fit in today. Um, I don't propose to go through them in detail unless you'd like me to, but I'm happy to take any questions on the framework and obviously inform your future work programmers as well. Thank you, Richard. As I alluded to before Richard's presentation, at this point we would normally have a cabinet member in and we would we would be scrutinising them and on the technical elements within the framework. But we may have some questions um, on on the, the the presentation itself and on uh, on Appendix One, but also there may be some element technical questions you may want to draw out of uh, Appendices Two and Three, which um, Richard might be able to deal with today. If not, um, then he'll signpost it back to the relevant officers, and then they'll email, email whoever asked the question. At, uh, a more uh, detailed response. So, if, if if members are happy with that, so we've got questions on. Yep, yeah, Councillor Figgins. Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, it's a bit of a rudimentary question, really, and it might go back to Hazel. We had the PSB select yesterday. Why do we have um, uh, the PSB? The PSB is a Monmouthshire PSB, so the PSB has its well-being objectives. So, why do we then separately, as a council, also have set a set of objectives? Are they not the same or, or completely aligned to the PSB objectives? Me to answer. The um, the, the Future Generation Act legislation sets uh, as an individual public body, which the council is. We have a duty to publish our own well-being objectives, as well as then being a part of the PSB, looking at the county-wide objectives. So, ultimately, it comes back to the legislation requiring us to do that. Although, as you say, it makes sense that where possible, those objectives would be aligned because they're based on the same evidence of need of well-being in the county. So I would imagine there would be strong alignment. The, the legislation means that they actually need to be developed at two separate times. So ours had to be published by March 17. The PSB's ones don't have to be published until March 2018. But it's certainly something I think we'll be looking to consider strongly is those alignment between objectives because, you say, it makes absolute sense that where there's an issue in the county and as a council we can have an impact on it. It's not just going to be for the Public Service Board. It's our, how we are individual objectives we can deliver that as an individual body body as well. So I feel that understand. But I think what we need to do is look at the language because we're talking well-being objectives, well-being objectives. So we may just need to look at how we distinguish the two, albeit they will fill the same statutory purpose that we have to do. Hazel, do you want, do you want to add to that? 
Mm. Yeah, just to add to that, really. I mean, it is about the alignment of the objectives, but when you scrutinise the PSB, you're scrutinising it as a body with an agreed plan, an agreed approach to deliver joint and collective wellbeing objectives. The responsibility was put on each of those bodies to develop their own objectives to make sure that they also complied with the requirements of the Act and therefore the Council has to produce its own wellbeing objectives as well. But obviously those do need to all be aligned. But when you scrutinise the PSB, you're not scrutinising the actions of, you're not scrutinising the individual partners on the PSB only insofar as it relates to the collective responsibility of the wellbeing objectives that they've agreed. So you're scrutinising them as a whole. If you felt that a partner wasn't delivering in line with the rest of the partners in delivering the joint objectives, then you could call that partner in and you could say, well, these are the objectives that the PSB has agreed to and your practice and your sort of delivery doesn't seem to support that. Why is that? So you can do that, but that is why your responsibility relates to the PSB as a whole and the performance of delivering that as a whole. But obviously, as a council being a, a body that sits on the PSB, it also has its own requirement to produce wellbeing objectives, which we've taken through the council scrutiny process. Okay. The other question, Councillor Davis. Thank you, Chair. Um, just on a, a sort of practical level, looking at the, the plans you've got here, I notice, for example, there are a few projects. Um, that are behind the original timescale. Yeah. Uh, I've been involved in quite a lot, quite a lot of very large projects. Uh, um, in the old-fashioned days, we used project planner, right? uh, and there were on every one of those projects there were things that held up that project being delivered. But we always implemented a reviewed timescale and a reviewed uh, plan for completion. And I don't see anything on here that says, well, yes, there are there are issues. This is behind the timescale. Okay, great when is this project going to be delivered? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's something perhaps that's missing here, that, you know, for, for example, when, I, when we were delivering a project, the time scale was very critical because it, it, it impacted on the works itself. Mm -hmm. So I think when, when you're reviewing a project, you also need to review the time scale and what's the completion date. Thank you. <clears throat> A very good point. I think what we've we tended to focus on previously here is is our progress against the actions and whether they're on on target or not. And in terms of those review meetings, will be happening. It's just we haven't serviced that information in the report. In terms of the wider framework, obviously, services will have service plans, project plans that will look to set those revised timescales and actually look to implement them. For this part of the report, we've tended to focus on progress we've made, not necessarily the future actions we have planned to address those. But it's a good point where we do have issues in terms of timescales not being met. And in future, we look to give clarity to the committee in terms of what the revised timescales and, and plans are. Often those are set within a separate plan. Um, but as we're, we're looking back on last year, I think it's a very good point that we need to consider in future including. So I totally, totally agree. If I can come back to the chair, I mean, it, it is essential for us, uh, I think, a committee to scrutinise yeah. to know, you know, what the issues are, what things are being in, put in place to, to, to deal with those issues and what the revised time scale for implementation is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Devi. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I, I'd like to follow up um, uh, on uh, Alan's co comments. Um, I mean, how agile is this report? Bearing in mind things that are happening around us at the moment um, that we have no control of, um, how agile is this report in being able to um, take account of that and reflect uh, the impact that these things are likely to have on uh, our, our population. Just, just take one thing, for instance, which is the removal, um, forecast removal of the tolls off the Seven Bridge. Already in Chepstow and Caldecott, that is uh, having a, a significant impact, impact on house, per, uh, house uh, sales. Um, I mean, you, uh, I ha know of a, a number of cases where houses are being sold in excess of what was um, an aspirational asking price, if you like, and they are 
uh, going very quickly. So you, it, it's, it, there's those sort of implications here, the long term. Those people may not even be working in our county because these people are coming from Bristol. So you, you've got the wealth earning dynamic, the other side of the channel, and the here, the, the they see the opportunity here of having houses that are basically cheaper to start off with, and on top of that, the cost of living in terms of community um, tax and all that sort of thing is 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 entirely different. I, I mean, it's even more complicated than that, but it's a good example, I I feel, of how I wonder whether this is uh, keeping pace with what's happening around. Yeah. And if it isn't, um, how are you going to accommodate that? Thank you, Chair. So, a few points there, I think, to answer, to hopefully give you some assurance about the, the, the framework being able to adapt and look at how we deal with, with the issues that arise. Firstly, in terms of the report in Appendix 2 today, we have a duty report back on the actions we set last year, which is what this report is just discharging that duty to do. Obviously, that's looking at 12, 18 months ago already in terms of our progress, but nonetheless, it gives you an idea about how we're performing. In terms of then actually dealing and addressing with some of those challenges that come in on an ongoing basis, that's where I talked about your reliance not and our reliance as a council, not just on those reports that come to you, but actually the framework in terms of being updated in council service planning, so how they look into uh, take actions that can actually address those issues that are coming forward in various ways. Um, if we use the example of, of sort of the example you just gave in terms of house prices and seven bridge tolls, etc., the wellbeing assessment has identified house prices as being an issue. It's come out from the engagement and the evidence we've got, and then now we know how we're looking to re respond. Our respond set up our responses to that as a council. That's an issue the Public Service Board is very much considering. And obviously the evidence on that will change on a frequent basis and we need to build that in on an ongoing basis, which is why I'm saying that the framework, the information you have available on the hub needs to be flexible to adapt to that. It has been previously and will continue to be um, going, going forward um, and how we need to make sure that the committee is receiving that information, not just in a meeting six weekly, but on an ongoing basis, you to understand about how the how actions are being progressed to, to plan for that. And that, along with a range of other information, will feed into the reviews of service planning, of bigger project plans, etc., in, in the council. So hopefully that, you, hopefully it's given you some background in terms of how it, how it operates and tries to pick up these, these issues. But they are big challenges, obviously, of course, as well. Are you satisfied with it? Do you want to come back, Councillor Debbie? Uh, it, it, yes, in part, uh, uh, Chair, but it, 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 it really does concern me that I think that things are happening at a faster rate than this report is, um, is moving. And uh, we can talk about uh, what is happening in the county or uh, what we intend to do in the county, but I would like to be seeing in this report as well uh, s something that um, uh, should be addressing the action that we need to take with the people that are outside uh, outside our county. I mean, Chepstow is an incredible problem we've got in Chepstow, where that whole town is going to uh, suffer a seizure within the next few years, mm -hmm. simply because of the growth in traffic, which is going to be even more. And if, if we don't have something in here that reflects what we as a council need to do, not only within ourselves, but looking to see what we are going to have to do with other people outside. God, isn't it stupid? It living in another nation, right? I mean, that is, that is a huge problem in itself. And I, I don't see that here. So um, I, I can understand everything about this uh, 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 and and applaud what it is doing but it, it it in my view is not going its remit isn't wide enough then and it's not moving fast enough perhaps that's the way i feel about it thank you chair 
obviously just to provide context this is a retrospective review from from uh, you know looking at this you know the previous annual year but i understand i understand your uh, your point entirely and you, you can come back on that Rob. thank you for that chair that's helpful as you say it's a retrospective looking back at action reviews he said i think the point you'll touch upon is actually the exact point that now we're looking to change from this was our improvement plan and uh, previous legislation which is um, potentially being consulted on about being repealed um, and the change then towards what we've doing well-being objectives and the Future Generations Act is looking at how we address some of those challenges and actually how we plan not just to deliver some of our own service performance improvements in our services but how we look at gathering the evidence for some of these real complex um, social and economic environmental challenges we're facing and look to make sure that the actions we're taking are addressing those and not just some of the smaller issues which um, which can seem quite big as well as accounts on their own so when we develop that detail um, in terms of our future planning report which will bring to you around the well-being objectives and the four which i've put up on screen earlier some of the actions under there will set out for you how we respond to some of these big issues whereas at the moment we're looking back at what was uh, an annual plan to deliver some certain objectives for last year but i think the issues you're talking about exactly there are things that the well-being objectives will look to address and we'll provide that detail of the actions we're, we're taking okay. any other questions i've got i've got some some questions um just in relation to uh, there may be more technical questions um richard so th they could if you if you want to note them down and ask relevant officers to to come back um the one is uh in relation to uh, we're on appendices two now um and uh, uh, objective three um we want to enable our county to thrive the issue in relation to affordable housing, um, there's, there's clearly an issue there that we're, we're falling behind um, some of our affordable housing targets and it may be something um, in the next um, agenda item we may want to look at for, for further scrutiny. But if I could have some a bit more detail on, on that and particularly um, the LDP review and when that when that review is, 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 is going to be finalised by, um, by, by, by Cabinet. Um, if I could have a bit more information on um, the um, project under the uh, Vibrant and Viable Places Initiative, the 91,000, um, uh, and, and some more detail on that, that would be great. Um, the Just in relation to the community hubs and um, the... Uh, the the reshaping and the uh, the remodelling of our service offer in, in our community hubs, and I know there's been some curtailment in 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 those service offers, but with the data there showing uh, a decline in footfall uh, in our public libraries where our hubs are, you know what what is the impact on that? Are we seeing you know uh, less people engaging with those hubs um, be, because of that? declining foot, foot, footfall and um, whether or not we need to I don't know look at that look at that model again uh, and, and whether or not it's delivering um, the other one going on to appendices three now um, is in relation to leisure centre uh, services and the, again the declining numbers in uh, for residents accessing those services and, and what the financial impact is on our bottom line um, on that, um, yeah, and yeah, the, the other one was it, 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 on appendice three. It goes back to um, it goes back to affordable housing, but I've just covered that, so that would be helpful. Thank you. Are there any other questions? No, Carl, Councillor Becker. Yeah. Uh, again, it's just a technical one. It looks like the tourism uh, that we predicted was up, going to be up one or two percent and it's only up half a percent what are the main reasons that we've underachieved so uh so badly in the tourism really so. okay thank you anything else no well thank you very much thank you richard for your presentation and um we look forward to uh scrutin scrutinizing cabinet members as they come forward um, on the on the respective uh performance plans so thank you very much
Okay, so if we move on to agenda item seven, uh, which is the uh, forward work program, um, Hazel has, has produced this very, very good report for us, which was sort of a follow-up really on, on some of the preliminary discussions we had at our last uh, uh, meeting. Um, do you want to speak to this, Hazel? Thank you. Conscious of time, and I don't want to talk too long about the process, but I think it is important that we make a couple of points about the process, how you set a work programme, who adds items to it, just so that you're clear, because once I've told you this, you can bear this in mind for the rest of the year, um, and then have a little discussion about issues that you might like to add but basically this is a planned approach to work programming it's your work program this is a sort of suggestion to help you maximize your effectiveness and, and how you can add value um, as a scrutiny committee you've got a responsibility to scrutinize performance via Richard's reports key risks in order to be able to provide challenge uh, you've also got a duty to scrutinize wider public services insofar as they relate to services provided to Monmouthshire citizens so for example if you wanted to call in the health board obviously this isn't relevant to this select committee but you could call in the health board to talk about services to adults in Monmouthshire you can call in BT to talk about broadband to your residents so you can you can look outside of council provision but only insofar as it relates to the people that are provided services in Monmouthshire you can't require them to attend but you can invite them to attend and it's unusual that they would not want to attend you need to think about your capacity and your resources because, as you'll see from this report, there's an awful lot of suggestions for scrutiny. You are required to set a work programme. It's not just something that um, it's a good idea to do. You're required under the uh, local government uh, Wales measure to do this, but also to publish it. So it's it's important to, to know that actually it's your work programme must be published online so that the public know what you're doing. They know if they can contribute. They There are suggestions on our web page that they can contact me if they've got ideas for scrutiny or the chair. We've also done a recent press release saying much the same. Get in some sort of stakeholders and public interested in the work that we do. We've got a Twitter account We're trying to encourage people through that. But your work programme, you've got a responsibility to produce and to actually um, make it available to the public. Um, as we, we've sort of briefly mentioned, there are certain things that will um, be statutory sort of things that have to be built into the work programme um, and, and they're very worthwhile ones, looking at the risk register, the key risks facing the council and the actions being taken to mitigate those. Obviously, performance monitoring reports and budget monitoring reports, you've experienced both of those now by your second meeting, I believe your last meeting you had budget monitoring. Um, the Cabinet's forward plan, the importance of this, this is attached to the agenda. Um, officers and Cabinet members are required to say what they're going to be also discussing for the future. Um, so it's a Cabinet and Council forward plan and decisions and forthcoming reviews are placed on that. That's a useful place for you to look um, if you're thinking, well, what's coming up? Is it on our radar? If it's not, why isn't it? Has it been added late? Is it something that we're interested in? You might be interested in something, but might not necessarily want to bring it to a meeting. But you could certainly, if you saw something on the Cabinet Forward Plan, it will say which officer has produced the report. You could get in touch with that officer and say, I'd like to have sight of that report, please. Any member can have sight of any report. You, no information is, is sort of kept from you. So... Um, Bear in mind that also when you're thinking about um, setting your work programme because certain things will come forward through the course of the year that wouldn't be in the plan at the moment, but you might think we want to do pre-decision scrutiny on this, have a one-off meeting, you can call special meetings, which are additional meetings of this committee to look at a single item with no minutes, no other business on the agenda, but solely look in depth at something. You will get suggestions from officers, perhaps from council members, other members who are not members of this committee, 
Also, um, cabinet members may suggest to you items for scrutiny and also the public. It would be remiss of you to not consider including those into your work programme. But when you do, I've set out a sort of uh, table in this report that is a healthy sort of checklist as to whether this warrants scrutiny or not, because you can become inundated with requests to look at different things. And the main things that I'd suggest to you, you need to think about is how you can add value, because you could spend an awful lot of time scrutinising something, but it might not actually add value. So some of the key things to think about is has anybody else looked at this recently has it been inspected recently by auditors what were their reviews what were their findings because the last thing you want to do is go and duplicate work that's already been undertaken or is being undertaken by others the main sort of uh, premise I suppose of scrutiny is to look at the the topics that will add the most value but also add to the strategic direction of the council so um, the the idea is that things that are coming forward in the big scheme of things in decision making some of the big challenges we've talked about today affordable housing we've got an LDP that's going to need revision some of these big things that are going to be serious decisions for the council to make you have an opportunity to get engaged and involved in those at an early stage the timing of scrutiny intervention is critical because if you get involved too late your ability to influence or make a difference has passed you miss the boat in terms of your impact so that's why it's so important to have a cabinet forward plan that's populated that has the detail in there and that you know what's coming up um, whilst cabinet forward plans are not always perfect one of the things that we've done uh, before I've brought this report to you is the former chair and the new chair and I have sat down and discussed some of the priorities of the previous select committee. She's also raised with us some ideas of, of things that might want to be scrutinised and it's, it's important for you to bear those in mind as you go along and build some sort of flexibility into the work programme because not everything will be apparent at this stage. So you, you do need to have some sort of flexibility to move things around and call special meetings as appropriate. Um, Richard's briefly referred to the fact that the council's improvement plan is that sort of process of, of producing one may sort of move more towards producing a corporate plan now and that will be that will be really a good idea and it will be very sort of instrumental really in making sure that everything is strategic and that there's alignment between different plans between service plans between a corporate plan and also making sure that your activity goes in the same direction you, you know it, it would be a, a bit unwise to spend an awful lot of time looking at a subject that totally goes against the rest of the council's priority and direction so it, it's worth bearing that in mind you, we do have quite a lot of public at select committees, not always at the ones that you've experienced so far, but if there's a, an item on the agenda that's of interest to them or a topic they want to suggest, they will get in touch. They do know we're here. We've had a, a lot of experience of, of dealing with members of the public, particularly at Strong Community Select. So they know we're here and they will get involved if, they, if, the, if they're interested. But again, we've got a duty to engage them in the work. So every time... You think of something you want to scrutinise, such as broadband. Think about who can we call in to this meeting. Obviously, the broadband provider, Welsh Government, as as sort of, um, you know, the, the commissioners of, of that sort of service, but also service users, people who are struggling with broadband in different areas. So think about every time you have an item on the agenda, who would be relevant people to call in so that you get the most rounded view that you can get as a select committee you need to be um, you need to come into these meetings with an open mind you need to be able to be objective and therefore whilst you might have your own views from the start it's best to keep those to yourselves to bring in different people and try and achieve a sort of broad perspective as, as broad as you can so this sort of report today suggests to you to try and identify the topics that you'd like to, to look um, at over the course of the year, those that will add the maximum value and those that are the highest priority for you. Um, there are different ways of doing things. Some 
committee set up task and finish groups we haven't had an awful lot of success with those because they take a long time to complete and sometimes they have missed the boat in terms of impact some of the the better committees have been where we've had a sort of one-off scrutiny meeting to look at something like a solar farm is this a good idea should we invest in one what's the pros and cons what are the implications what are the really big risks for us and the select committee was able to make a series of recommendations which went straight to the cabinet and aided that decision significantly. It's an example of a pre-decision scrutiny, but it, it's a really useful critical friend role that you can play to executive decision making. So there's lots of different routes besides task groups. So 4.1, uh, just a few sort of uh, key principles, reminders to you to involve the public in, in your meetings, try and support corporate priorities, think about the timing of scrutiny to ensure maximum impact, and also try and be realistic, try and think about what you can actually achieve within your own capacity, because I'm aware that some of you are sitting on multiple select committees, and that does take up an awful lot more time. Um, you've got a checklist in there, which we can um, we'll, we'll keep that sort of available for when you want to sort of think about work programming. We can ask those questions, test um, test certain topics against that. Five point one basically just gives you a, a sort of flavour really of what the previous scrutiny committee looked at through the year, and there's an awful lot there, and it does look quite intense given that you only have eight meetings a year, but there were approximately four or five special meetings, and some of these subjects such as uh, planning, um, housing, affordable housing, those were scrutinised jointly with other committees. Again, alternative service delivery model, those were done jointly. So there are certain things that it would be of more benefit to, to have a joint meeting on. And then 6.2 just uh, lets you know that myself, the chair, officers have sort of provided some input into this report so that the suggestions in there are not just uh, out of a hat. Um, and there you've got under 6.2 some suggested things for scrutiny. Uh, some of these uh, have come from members while sitting on a bus going around Monmouthshire. Um, impact a seven toll um, reduction. That, that was something that was suggested by a couple of members on a bus. They made it their way into this plan. Um, so they, they, we're, we're scheduled there to have a future economies analysis for November. Um, broadband, again, previous issue that's been scrutinised but keeps coming back ongoing issue for scrutiny and that's been suggested by an officer that they'll have something to bring to you by September. So there's the list of topics and it, you set your work programme, it's your responsibility to do so in conjunction with advice obviously from myself, from other officers, from other people that will suggest topics but it really is your work programme, it's your workload and you choose what you'd like to scrutinise. Okay. Thank you Hazel. Um, I suppose before I open up for discussion, um, uh, given, as you said, we, we only meet um, eight times a year and there are a number of um, uh, listed possible areas for scrutiny, whether or not we need to sort of identify and prioritise probably three or four um, key areas. And would that be three or four on, on top of these suggested ones, Hazel, or, you know, yeah that be okay okay councillor davis thank you chair um i mean looking at this list there there are lots of items there that could fit into one overall heading if you know what i mean uh, rather than doing them on an individual basis like that we talk about the future uh, momisha future plan uh, business development there are lots of things in there that could fit into that category and, and i think you know in terms of workload it's essential that we identify three or maybe four overall headings uh, and then we then start fitting things to, to scrutinise within those headings. Uh, another point I'd like to make is that um, as I'm new to this, uh, this system, um, it strikes me that if we do that and we identify and we concentrate on three or four headings, then really as a group we need to meet other than on the day of this meeting because we need to get together, discuss, various people can put their own points in. And when we come into this room, you know, we're all clear about which way we are going and what we're going to scrutinise, who's going to ask what, uh, and that we are asking the right questions. I suggest a suggestion, but I think that should happen. 
Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, that's very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Becker? Um, I'd agree with that, for starters. I think that uh, the amount of work involved, if we're going to do it properly, we're going to need to talk more often. In terms of the process, uh, one for Hazel, I suppose, if we want to try and bring in, um, like, say, academic opinion, um, where would that fit in our, our sort of work programme thing? That would one of us suggest that we agendarise it for one of the meetings or...? Would that sort of thing normally be set up ad hoc? It, it's, I think you need to think about it in terms of a topic-by-topic topic basis. Mm -hmm. So every topic you want to look at, think about who the relevant people are. And if you feel that, say, f for broadband, if you felt that you wanted an academic opinion, you could say to me, well, you know, what about this person? And it's very unusual that somebody would want payment. Usually they're happy to just attend and cover we cover their, their mileage or, or whatever we've never been asked before to pay expenses to people so yeah I, I think within reason and diaries people are usually willing to come and, and they're not expecting any recompense so but those presentations would take place normally as part of the uh of that particular agenda. Yeah, I, th I think you, you need to look at things on a topic by topic basis. And then if you think that you you feel there's some some sort of input that's worthwhile, whether it's stakeholders, for instance, when when we looked at broadband, obviously BT were to be invited to the meeting, Welsh Government were to be invited to me the meeting to discuss the performance of the rollout of the contract. And then we brought in lots of different businesses and stakeholders who'd had issues with broadband. We had the Cabinet member there to give his perspective. So you, you want to have as many interested and engaged and the appropriate people in the room at that time. And I think the best way to do that is to think about each topic. So for instance, if, if at the end of the work, each meeting, you tend to look at your work programme. And if we said, okay, at the next meeting, we've got this person, we've got this subject on the agenda. At that point, I would expect you to say to me, well, actually, we feel it'd be relevant to have these individuals in, can we organise that? And that then gives me usually a month or so to try and organise that and get those those people to attend. But it's always good to think at the end of each meeting, what have we got coming forward? Who would we need to hear from? And then if you feel that you, you actually want to sit down amongst yourselves and plan some questions we can arrange a meeting it doesn't have to be a live stream meeting those sort of meetings planning sessions are best uh, as meetings where you sit around a table and think well where, where do we want to go on this what are our lines of inquiry what are we trying to get out of this subject what's the outcome that we want to intend we intend to achieve for that meeting so I, I agree with you totally there are certain there are certain topics where you can just say we want an update report on that and the officer will bring it at the next meeting. You don't really need to do an awful lot more other than try and attend the pre-meeting at half nine and give your questions, form some basis of structure. But there are other topics where you really do need to sit down and work out what you can achieve. You know, whether it's something you can affect, certain things you want to scrutinise, such as broadband, there's an extent to which you can influence and, and your role is probably to lobby and keep holding to account rather than being able to actively do anything. But you can then place responsibility on your cabinet member to do certain things on your behalf and your officers. So then your role again is holding them to account in doing so. So it's useful to sit down and, and think, well, what do we want to look at? At. if this is a bigger subject what are we hoping to achieve what can we actually affect and influence what's the desired outcome because I don't want you to have meetings that are a waste of time you know if, if, if you've come out of a meeting and you've thought that it was just a talk shop and it didn't achieve anything that's not a good result for any of us really does that make sense absolutely I was just interested also in the uh, fact that those kind of things take place on the day rather than we would take uh, that sort of advice or um, receive that kind of information prior to the day, really, to allow us to, you know, digest it. To better inform it it our depends decisions. what it is. It depends what the subject yeah. is, how 
you know, if you do, not all subjects will require that sort of thing. But right. to give give you a sort of instance with strong communities, they wanted to look at gypsy and traveller prov- provision in the county. They didn't want to just wait till the day to hear from relevant stakeholders. So they set up a meeting with the stakeholders in advance a week before. They ju- sort of came out with a little report from that of what the the stakeholders said so that they could go into the select committee armed with we've met with stakeholders this is the view of the different stakeholders that we've met with and then they can put that against you know the officer sort of report and the officer was able to see that in advance so that you know we don't we don't want to have meetings where we constantly have to say we'll have to get back to you we'll have to get back to you so and so hasn't got the answer today the idea is when we come to a select committee we are live streaming the meeting the public might watch you. They want to have answers as well. There's no point having meetings that are a waste of time. So by the time you come in here, yes, we should have covered off those different angles. But again, not every subject no. or not every report would require that in depth. But when there are ones where you want to do that, it is best that we have a planning session. We discuss that in advance so that when we come here on the day, we're clear what we want to get out of it. And we tailor our approach appropriately yes. per topic. That's yeah. great. That's, thanks. Councillor Fikins. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd echo what's already been said in as much as I think we need to focus our um, efforts. Um, we're the Economy and Development Select Committee at the end of the day. Um, and I think pairing back all of the work that we're doing in Monmouthshire as a county so far, the future Monmouth is definitely something which is fundamental to the very core and the underlines and underpins all the other work that's been, been t- taking place, really. And, and, and it's cohesive in that, effect, in, in that effect as well. If we, my thinking, if we were to focus on three or four, you know, a, a, a small number of issues, which as Alan said, it will tick off, you know, if, if we were to focus on future more moisture, that's going to tick off a lot of these other things which we can effectively, effectively put on the back burner for a second, but keep referring back to them because they are relative to the work that future more moisture is doing and keep us focused on that work doing. But if we can be on the same page as the future more moisture rollout, um, then that will enable us to keep a dynamic and well thrashed out um, uh, approach um, to um, to delivering what we hope to deliver and hope to achieve as, as a committee. And if we only have three or four big big ticket items, as it were, on the agenda, um, then that gives us the flexibility to always call in other ad hoc things as and when and to give, keep us, you know, give us the freedom in our mind, if you like, without being overloaded with a huge raft of, of um, and broad stretch of topics. Councillor Davis. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we've talked about the public attending the meetings, and I, I'm just I'm just thinking now, thinking out loud, really, whether obviously there's information sent to the authority about what the concerns are of the public before the meeting takes place. Uh, and I'm wondering whether, as a committee member, we should be seeing those concerns because, of, you know, we think we know what the public think, but we don't really know what they think. And it would be, as part of our discussions, it would be nice to have, you know, what what the, what the public are thinking and what communications the authority has had about a particular topic from the public when we have our discussions. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Yeah, yeah. Councillor Devi. Um, really, going back a little bit uh, um, to what I said earlier. One of the things that uh, we are not uh, uh, discussing and really is key to a lot of what happens in South East Wales is really the joint re- responsibility between local government here in, uh, in Monmouthshire and also local government in Gloucestershire if you like, and even uh, maybe Bristol, but let's stick with Gloucestershire at the moment. Uh, and uh, I think one of the things that we should be um, talking about is the cross-border uh, issues. And um, I, I think it would be it would be a, a, a good idea that uh, if if we were to invite. Um, a, a a person, a cabinet member, or, f- or somebody like that from um, uh, from Gloucestershire. We have in had some discussions first to get us out of the position where we've got so many cross-border issues common to both counties uh, 
And because we're in these silos at the moment of Monmouthshire and Gloucester and uh, Wales and England, they're not being addressed. And the only way that they're going to start to be addressed is if we talk to one another and really agree on what uh, what what major issues and opportunities um, affect both the areas of the county on border in the Y, if you will, and what we should do about it. Because if we don't, then nobody is going to do anything. You're not going to get any initiative down from the assembly. You're too far away in Westminster. We might manage to get the two MPs involved as well. We might ma manage to get the AMs involved as well. But I think here as a committee, we have within our remit the ability to start this because we have got to start something. Otherwise, it's going to be an unconstructive, unconstructive, absolute mayhem on both sides of the water with communities being at loggerheads with, with one another. And I, I see that as one of the big challenges for Monmouthshire. Um, our particular area of Bombershire, if you like, and indeed Gloucestershire. I mean, just to illustrate the thing, uh, people who live in Gloucestershire have NP uh, Newport uh, postal codes. And there is a lot that goes with post the co commonality of postal codes. Um, because they're used as references on all sorts of things, even credit scoring and, and things like that. So I think this is one of the big issues we could look at to pioneer. I've been leading for a long time, but having had this conversation here, which in my period with the council, we've never got near this, I think it's an opportunity to have a go. I don't know what you think, Mr Chairman. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I, I'm certainly a, a, an advocate of, uh, of exploring those those challenges, not just with Gloucestershire, but with with the whole of Seven Side and, and our links with with uh, Bristol, but also Westwood. Um, and we've obviously got a, a major stake uh, and interest in the city deal, which is something I think we can't let slip either. It's something that we need to. to obviously, we, yeah, 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 yeah. We're already investing in that. But We've got we an to... investment in there um, uh, academically and uh, financially. So that is um, that is underway. But we've got this totally negative situation on our eastern border, if you like. Do you want to come back, Hazel? On that? Yeah, there was a couple of points that have been made. Um, Councillor Feekins made the point about three or four big ticket issues coming under the sort of overarching future Monmouthshire umbrella, I think that's a, a good idea. Um, sometimes you can do more justice to three or four things than you can do to lots of other things. Um, just because reports have historically come to you, progress monitoring reports perhaps on different schemes, you, you don't have to say, well, we're going to include those in our work programme forever. But sometimes officers think, well, you know, do we really want to lose sight of those things going to scrutiny? Other options available to you are to say, well, we'll we'll have that report emailed to us. If we've got any comments on it or any queries, we can forward our responses to the officer so that they've got the view of the select committee, but you don't have to actually table them to a meeting for a full discussion if you don't want to. Similarly to today, um, you can think about giving some items more time. Obviously, that first item needed a lot more time. And certain reports will be more light touch progress monitoring kind of reports where, you know, you, if you're happy with progress, you might have a few issues, concerns, questions, but perhaps don't require the, the depth. Um, in terms of the, the, the public contribution you made, the point, Councillor Davis, I think... The way the legislation looks at it, it, re it sort of refers on us the duty to consult with the public. Now, when we bring things to scrutiny, if we're aware of public's views, we'll, we'll provide them to you. 
we, we, we do that as a matter of course. Um, but the the responsibility to kind of actively go and get the public's views sits with with, with us and with with elected members. So what I would hope is that on some of the issues that you prioritise for scrutiny, you, you would actually say, well, OK, outside of the select committee, let's go and organise something where we go to Chepstow and we talk to people and find out what their concerns are about a particular issue. It's usually better if, obviously, you're doing this on a topic-by-topic -topic basis. Otherwise, it's going to become massive. But if you go out and talk to the public about specific issues, we've done it as part of the um, wellbeing assessment, you'll find that people are quite willing to have a chat with you. They, they want to get involved. So I think those are things that we can do outside of the meeting that would probably add another dimension to the work but would probably be more interesting for you rather than just sitting in county hall for your eight meetings a year you could do that and you'd satisfy the requirements for scrutiny arrangements and i would say yes we've got effective scrutiny arrangements in place but if you really want to do it justice and not just pay lip service to it then we do need to get out on the road more and find out what people think and that's part of the sort of democracy side of your role I'm not sure if that's a sign. <laughs> Maybe it's a sign I should stop. But I take it on board um, Councillor Dovey's points. And I think that you were right, that what we don't really look cross-border on any of these big issues. And whilst I think the work programme needs to sort of hone in on certain issues, I think certainly things like affordable housing and the impact of the toll reduction are going to have big issues cross border and if you're going to look at something like that then you know it would be worth saying well yes let's get let's invite the scrutiny chair and the cabinet member of the relevant committee um, and portfolio from Gloucester to come and have a discussion with us on some of these issues because I, th I think you're right this sort of imaginary uh, wall around Wales just doesn't exist and we need to be more flexible and talk to our neighbouring authorities who are probably experiencing similar issues to us and and I, th I would still recommend you do that on a topic by topic basis I think that's the best the most logical and practical way to to set your work program but you need to be thinking every time you scrutinize something who is it we need to talk to how are we going to actually have the best possible perspective on this and if it means that you need to talk to people across but boundary then we do that if we need to talk to public and organize a specific public event where we go out and talk to people then we do that as well okay do you thanks hazel do you think um in terms of uh i think what Councillor Davis and Councillor Feekin said in terms of hanging a couple of additional topics under a, an overarching theme is is would, is that manageable? You know, if we look at if we look at affordable housing and, and uh, one or two other topics within the future Monmouthshire, that that would be manageable. I think probably if a good start would be to have future Monmouthshire on an agenda where you can see what those main streams are and you can I mean there'll be lots of streams on there but you'll be able to say well we think those are three really important things and we want to focus in on those I think the first start is to to get them in and have a discussion about what that program we know what the program is is about but what are the where are the areas that we can make a difference because there's no point in us getting involved in things that we can't make a difference if there are other areas where we can. And, and the the other issue um, in terms of previous previous work um, that the committee has done, um, I know um, that the business breakfast um, there was a, a report in terms of um, the, the 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 county's um, delivery of, of of business improvement uh, for small businesses. Um, do we need? Do we need to bring that back? I mean, how long ago was that? Was that over a year ago? Do we need to bring that those those recommendations and how those recommendations were implemented or, or acted on? Do we, is that something that, that should come back as well? I think it would be useful for you to have sight of that, and I can email you that after this meeting if you like. Um, just for context, really, the select committee decided that it wanted to engage with businesses to try and find out what their issues were. So it was a very blank sheet of paper, 
but talking to people um, across across all of Monmouthshire, we had a good. We didn't have loads of people, but we had a good cross um, cross geographic spread, and um, we actually came up with the things that the council can do something about. What are the issues that are affecting businesses that we can do something about? Not Welsh government, not others where we have to lobby and uh, and we might not be able to to affect impact, but what are the things that are really, you know, crucial to businesses that we can do something about? So we came, uh, we arrived with a report from that, which we took to the select committee, which was briefly discussed at a meeting, but we didn't feel that we had all the right people in front of us. We wanted to discuss it with the head of planning. We wanted to discuss it with the tourism manager, discuss it with the head of highways, because there were different aspects in that came out of that that needed to be discussed with different officers. So the following meeting we had the range of officers before us and we literally singled out certain sort of key outcomes relating to each officer and each directorate and we tried to sort of find out what we could actually affect change wise outcomes wise so I can send that to you and then if you feel there are any areas in there that you want to explore further and and have another look at that we can do that the one thing that we did come out to that session saying was that it what we didn't feel it was necessarily the council's role to start setting up business breakfasts because a long time ago we did do that but there were other forums and other um, existing sort of opportunities for businesses to meet. And we felt we'd be doing those an injustice if we started setting up regular business breakfasts when, when those sort of that framework already existed. But we did think it was a very useful one off opportunity to engage with businesses and to actually come out of there with a series of things that actually these are things that the council could do something about to help these businesses and put some of it was just putting different people in touch with each other who didn't know that the other existed in terms of advice different events things where they could promote their business at some of the Monmouthshire food festivals and and sort of making some contacts so it was a useful exercise but we can I can send that to you and if you feel it would be helpful to revisit then then we could do that. Okay Councillor Feekins. Thank you Chair. Um, just going back to the um, forward one with any, we are going to do that as, as one of the big head, you know, big ticket items. It, would it be wise then to call them in as, as a either sort of workshop workshop meeting or some sort of maybe an informal get together with us as a select so that we're, we're, we're more on the same page uh, just to bring us up to speed probably and then we can be more or let, get them on the same page as well then so they can understand where, what we would like to sort of take as the next steps. Councillor Davis. Thank you. <coughs> I completely agree with you. Councillor Devi? Um, just to cast a little light on the business breakfast, there was um, one real anomaly that came out of that, and just give one example, um, was that we, we didn't uh, get to peop certain people in certain segments. Um, for instance, there was one guy that came from Newhouse Estate, and he came... Uh, to the meeting because he had heard from somebody, just third party, that it it was going on. I think it was somebody's wife. So he turned up. He was the only person that turned up. And he had phoned around all the businesses in Newhouse Estate and nobody knew about it. We had lots of people from tourism and, I, I, I can, and, and food, and I can understand that because it's a big chunk of our... A economy, but there is the opportunity for our economy, its dynamic, to change uh, with what we've been talking about, the bridge shows and uh, not be, Wales not being a high cost place to access or travel from. 
Um, so the, it, we would need to, uh, if we're going to do something in that vein, or even if we're going to contact in some other way, we really need to get a grip of who are the people that are actually in business in key areas, it, at least as the point that Alan's making about um, uh, South East Monmouth, which is Cardigar, Chepstow and whatnot. There are businesses down there that I'm sure we have no idea of what they are or who they, uh, what, who they deal with. There's one in Chepstow, uh, 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 Magic, down by the station. They design uh, the um, bits and pieces for most Apple um, uh, calculators and all that sort of thing. So we need to do some research if we're going to go into that area. And the other thing is, uh, we were talking about uh, sort of big tic ticket areas that um, uh, affect uh, Gloucestershire and and ourselves here. We've only talk, got to talk about two, and there are no bigger ticket ed uh, items ourselves. And that is uh, uh, tr uh, transport and housing, which are absolutely key down, down where we are at the moment. And they have an interest in, uh, uh, you, we're beginning to find this with their local council. They uh, realise they have, uh, we have a joint interest. And transport, whether it be trains or the bypass, which is really surely to God, one of the biggest things that we should be involved in for the health and well-being of, of South East Wales is, um, is, is really of key importance. And we, I think we should be grappling with that, even if we are the seed corn to make the thing grow, you know, and get our politicians involved in it seriously, both sides of the world. A lot of people involved, our own citizens. Okay, before Thank I go you, to Chair, I won't say anything. No, more. it's okay. Before I go to Councillor Becker, I think Hazel just wanted to come back on that. Yeah, I, d I don't want this to sound like a, a sort of cop out or an excuse, really, but um, it, I, I want to let new members know that we did issue press releases, several actually, to local papers. Um, Sarah wrote the press release and it was issued via Twitter, Facebook. We tried a lot of different methods, but I think Councillor Dovey is right that. People have got lives and they're doing different things. They're not necessarily just sitting around waiting for the council to get in touch with them. And I think um, that what we need to do really is we, we've got to be very proactive. Public engagement is, is really hard. It's really difficult. And we talk about reaching people and hard to reach people. But these are businesses that have just got loads of other things to do other than just wait around for us to try and engage with them by getting them to come to County Hall. I think, as Councillor Dovey suggested, we need to do research, find out who these businesses are. And we might we, we're going to need to go to them. And that means that really scrutiny and public engagement is very much um, a proactive part of your role and you are the people that uh, represent your areas you know far more about these businesses and these communities and the stakeholders that we need to speak to than I ever would so I'm relying on you as my intelligence to sort of say well we need to speak to these people can we get these people involved um, and, and that really essentially is is what scrutiny is all about and it's probably the most difficult part of it because you know we can set a work program and as you say we can sit here and ask a few questions and decent questions but if you really want to make a difference the harder stuff as in going out and getting in touch with these people and trying to find their views that's public engagement and that's really part of your role and it, it's not going to be easy but we can do it you've just got to have have the will to go out and it's going to take a lot of time and that's why it brought us back to the capacity issue as well chair Thank you. councillor becker uh just a couple of things <clears throat> on the cross-border issue um, it is multifaceted, and I agree it has to be per topic, but if we've got a checklist of things that we're doing as a select committee, that cross-border scrutiny needs to be right up there with our main priorities. We do not do anything in isolation, and increasingly, as the bridge tolls come down and what have you, we will do even less in isolation. So it really needs to be up there as an important thing. We talked about hanging three or four big topics um, and putting some of these uh, these subjects under those uh, topics. When do we want to do that? You know, do we want to do it now? 
do we want to do it at a meeting very soon? I, I'm very keen to sort of, you know, actually start wrangling with the issue. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and really those, those are the two points I want to make. If I was going to hang four topics out there now, I'd put it as the impact of the seven bridge tolls, affordable housing and transport, tourism and enterprise, which includes leveraging the city deal. Those would be my four broad brush strokes. So as a starting point. Right. Was that was that five or four? Well, <laughs> if you say, if you call affording I, affordable housing and transport, I kind of lump in together as a kind of, you know, as the one. But yeah. Okay, so if we look at uh, a, a way forward, then do you think uh, having a a workshop session, perhaps on 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 the future Monmouthshire? As a, as a starting point, we can potentially drill down on, on some of those issues there, which could be affordable housing, it could be well be transport, it could be how we, yeah, absolutely, version together, um, how we market ourselves as a, as a county as well. Um, I think that probably is a, is a, is a good starting point. Uh, would we be happy with um, with the suggested items um, on, on um, the, a potential forward? forward work program from sort of september october i know councillor blake Bro is keen on on uh, broadband updating and keeping the the momentum and pressure there on both welsh government and and bt um and obviously in um the, the rurality of awards she's keen in terms of looking at um, the rural development program uh, and and if potentially from an update there may be there may be another area that we may want to drill down on that on within the rdp uh, particularly are we utilizing funds um would just looking at the just thinking about the the the, the impact of the seven toll uh, reduction could we roll cross-border issues into that or would that be too much uh, too much under one 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 banner so that so so the cross so is so we can use so we can use cross borders that as the as the ha coat hanger and then and then there would be impacts then on seven tools etc okay so that's a, another area then we, we could look at cross border issues um and is is november hazel our last meeting this this calendar year do we meet in december You've got. You've also got budget scrutiny, which comes in November and pretty much takes up an entire meeting. It's usually quite intense. So, um, but as I say, you can organise special meetings as you feel appropriate. Um, I mean, some of these things on here that are updates, you might say, well, okay, we're interested in them. Can we just have them as reports sent to us, and then if we want to drill down on anything in that we can go back to it i mean it's important that you get the information so that you're aware and you're up to date um but it doesn't mean you've got to actually sit down and, and you know spend a lot of time on it necessarily unless you had concerns otherwise so would we, in, and in terms of the employability grant is is that is just is that an up, is that an update report it's something actually, Chair, I'm, I'm not that familiar with, so it looks like it's a new report, but we can certainly ask for the report to be circulated, and then you can decide if you wanted to, to, to add it to the agenda or, or not. I think broadband is a clear one that you'd want to have um, at a meeting. Um, the agri-urban update, I think that's a position update again, um, and the RDP programme update. Um, that that's an update but you might want to call them back but it's certainly worth starting off with having those reports emailed to you and then perhaps you can you can decide if you want to bring them back otherwise they take up what two yeah. meetings and and you haven't looked at the things you really want yeah. to look at in terms of the cross-border things I think Councillor Becker's right cross-border comes into everything that you might want to scrutinize so each topic I would then think who do we need to speak to is this cross-border or not rather than just saying let's let's come up with a list of cross-border I think it might work better the other way around and the topics that Councillor Becker has suggested seem you know an appropriate top four to me Councillor Devi, you wanted to come back on, on that? Just to comment on the agri-urban uh, thing and ask, ask Hazel a question. I think this was something that Councillor Prosser 
became involved in, wasn't it a European uh, uh, EC uh, a, initiative? And if that's the case, where does it s s stand now? I'm going to have to come back to you on that. I know it's been, uh, it has been given to another member, but off the top of my head, I'm not sure. I, I think I know which one it is, but I wouldn't want to say here on live streaming in case I'm wrong. So can I come back to you on that? Of course. Okay. I, I, I was only trying to be helpful. Yeah, it's, I, I'm pretty sure when, um, after the first council meeting, we sort of rolled over some of those responsibilities quite quickly. I'm just not sure I can say now who it is. I'll have to check. And the only other, other one, and I'm not I, I'm just tossing the pebble in the water, if you like, because it was at the end of the day, we've got to decide on priorities. But the thing that has in this committee rolled along um, for, for some years, of course, is tourism and the way we handle it. And the tourist centres with Chepso again is, is, is a big issue. But uh, I, I saw a programme on the uh, box um, two nights ago, three nights ago, and they were talking about the performance of tourism in Wales, which isn't, isn't doing particularly well at the moment. And I just wonder if uh, we could pick up that. I, I think somewhere we we ought to have. I think somewhere we ought to have a report back anyway on tourism. We ought. It, it is fundamental to us as as a county. Um, I know we're trying to squeeze things into a pint pot here, yeah, but I yeah. don't think you can leave tourism without having an eye on it if you like. I, I think there is a report coming to us uh, in the autumn please on yes um, tourism and destination management plan is listed there because the destination management plan has just uh, finished its consultation period so there was a wide public consultation on that so I know they want to bring that to you and the steam figures the performance figures so yes I think that's intended to come at a October time Okay, conscious that we need to wrap this one up. So we have before a um, workshop session then on future Monmouthshire plan as a start. We can drill down then on some of those issues. Um, I think we should keep the broadband and infrastructure uh, for September. The employability grant and um, agri-urban urban grant, if we can have those reports sent to us and then we can decide whether or not we need to, to, to delve deeper on those. Um, I'd like to keep the RDP session in because uh, that might yield some more uh, fruit for us. And then um, cross-border challenges perhaps for for October. Could we do that in October as a start? That might well. That might super. If we look at the cross, that might supersede that that um, the, the 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 tools tools. Sorry, Chair. I thought we were on the understanding that actually cross border wouldn't be a topic in its own right. It would merely be a priority for each topic that we discussed. So okay. Yeah, it would be an overhang, uh, and then it, we would drill down on those on those issues within that that overhanging topic. I think. Um, Could I just say we ought to be talking? To, I, I understand that. But the issue of how we make these contacts with our cross-border colleagues, I think that is something that really needs to be started now. I, I, I think leaving it to October is a big chunk of time being lost. I think it would be worthwhile showing an interest and I can certainly get in touch with scrutiny colleagues there and I'm sure they can sort of then discuss with their cabinet member that we'd be interested in perhaps having some discussions later on in the autumn. So I think it would be a good idea for me to do that now so that it's not a surprise in the autumn. Um, the only other thing I was going to mention is the cycling and walking product was suggested by an officer here but I would feel it's probably more appropriate for stronger communities. It's up to you. Councillor Feekins, and then Councillor Becker. Uh, just going on the cross-border um, issues, maybe, uh, I know it's another workshop, but another workshop to find some commonality between, because obviously they've got issues, they not, might not be the same issues that we have, um, but maybe a sort of workshop, informal workshop to begin with, just to sort of thrash out those issues before we sort of bring them back and drill down 
to specific areas. Yeah, that's a good point. With with Gloucestershire and and, and potentially Bristol as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Councillor Packer. Um, just on the subject of the walking and cycling product, um, the destination management plan in tourism places Chepstow as the walking and cycling epicenter of Monmouthshire and uh, um, into the Forest of Dean as well. So actually, a lot of what we're doing in tourism in promoting our economy is tied into that walking and cycling product. And at the moment, it's very lacklustre. It's it's not being uh, promoted in the correct way. It's not being leveraged in the right way. I think it does come under us. So... I think if you have your um, report then on the tourism and destination management plan, then that will come out of that. Um, I think it was a suggestion from an officer that obviously, as you say, it is a bit lacklustre and that that's something they want to develop. So I'm not thinking that that's an immediate thing, but it was suggested arising from that. That makes sense. So thanks. And just just in terms of city deal, is, uh, do, will we get progress up, update reports on each? Because I know there's uh, obviously the cabinet are meeting on Friday to to, to sign off a particular aspect of um, of uh, of that. Um. Yes, at the moment the scrutiny of city deal is done in house by each local authority. Um, I think that's um, not necessarily the plan forever, but for the foreseeable future until sort of the. Welsh Government has finished discussions on the future of regional scrutiny and that sort of uh, profile. I think at the moment it's it's been too soon really to have had uh, joint scrutiny with the others on, on, on that. But we have had regular updates to this committee and I think the one was just the last one was just before the election. But um, it, it's probably timely to have one perhaps towards the autumn now, particularly given the um, semi-compound conductor. Uh, at the time, that hadn't been announced. So, I mean, there's is definitely progress to report to you. OK, colleagues, happy that we've got a, we've got a, a, a plan shaping up there. Um, I think, we've, uh, I think we've, we, we've done that. Sorry, Chair. Um, it, it's like everything. When you, you start looking at the picture, it... There's sorts, to be all sorts of elements in it. Um, the fact of the matter is, and we don't take any notice of it in, in Monmouthshire, uh, because the vast majority of Monmouthshire is cars and tractors. But there is a, a, a hugely important a small area of Monmouthshire, which is the 19 uh, miles of line between uh, Chepstow and um, Seven Tunnel. Um, and the, uh, uh, the issue how that serves in a, a, a huge number of people in a very important part of our county and um, all that goes with that. And we've got coming up the, uh, the franchises being renegotiated. Um, very soon, we'll be talking about it next week. Um, and that has a big impact for a lot of people who live in here. I, I mean, I always say to people well, about my ward, for instance, uh, when they ask what's it like to live in and that sort of jazz, I say, I always throw in that we've got three airports. And they go, you know, there's Cardiff and there's Bristol, and where's the other one? I say, Heathrow. Because I, I, there is in Chepstow and the surrounds a huge number of business people that actually travel to Heathrow on a regular basis and up to the city on a regular basis uh, for, bus for business purposes. And the other thing is the dynamic of this area as a lo location for those sort of businesses and business people is going to change with Crossrail. Um, a lot of people don't realise you're going to be able to get into a train and go to Canary Wharf with just one stop. And that's Reading. And if you see all the money that they spent on Reading Station, you will see how important the Berkshire things, Reading and that location is to people coming in from all over the place. And that is important to the economy of um, South Wales and Monmouthshire as well. So uh, you, there, there is an element of, of transport in here 
I don't think you can. I don't think you can miss out on it. It is. It we have to include. It is vital. Um, just to give you an example, I know a lot of people uh, are not aware of it, but we started off with a small car park at Seven Tunnel Junction, which started to develop into a hub with people parking all over the place. We have now 400 cars parking there a day to get on trains, and they're local business people who are going to do their business and come back, local businessmen and that sort of thing. And if somebody gave me three acres and said, here's three acres, we've got this three acres, will you put a car park on it? Would how many? I'd fill it. I'd literally fill it in a fortnight because this area is strategically well placed and a lot of people use it. So transport is something. All right. Sorry. And potentially, I mean, it could fall under one of those one of those overhanging topics that we could drill down on. I think the overhanger for that is the LDP because the LDP obviously, um, you know, needs to take account of how people live, how they work, what their transport patterns are. And you're right, Heathrow is really not that far from Chepstow. And, you know, that is going to have an effect on housing. So it does sort of sit with affordable housing transport under the hang of the LDP and also obviously digital um, infrastructure that sits under that as well because it's people's patterns of living work and and recreation so I think you're definitely going to need to scrutinize the LDP but I would suggest that one probably would be best to do as an, a joint select of all or four selects just because of the, the sheer interest with members I think there'll be probably lots of workshop sessions and and so on seminars before um, any sort of formal work but maybe you wouldn't want to put that in your committee's remit specifically because of that and it allows you then time to do some of the other things that councillor beck has mentioned but yeah it's inextricably linked there's no denying that back briefly uh, one i i understand I, I understand the border principle things that Hill is talking about but unfortunately other things that are happening that it don't take any account of our LDP and one is the franchise agreements and the other is the plans for the metro at the moment and it, that is important with the links to Cardiff and whatnot and hopefully being able to push that up as far as Chepstow and if you have the burgeoning population as well in Gloucestershire and whatnot, uh, then it, that is going to make the chance of having the metro up as far as Chepstow. I mean, this is the one good side of the housing problem on the other side, if you like. So those things are being debated and they're going to be finalised now, long before we get to our LDP. So we've got to have it in, in our mind if you like. I'm not trying to contradict you, Hazel, in any way. Councillor Becker? Um, just a quick one to get something out of my mind and into some minutes is that under the sort of heading of enterprise, uh, we also should be scrutinising how are we providing mechanism for these commuters to turn into entrepreneurs in our local economy, you know, because we are becoming they're greatly a, a commuter economy and we, we really need to bring that... Uh, investment back in um, and I think we Chepstow is actually a metro station uh, so do I <laughs> apparently so it's not you and I <laughs> <Thanks. but> okay. <laughs> okay um so are you are you happy Hazel that we've got we've got the, the, the broad um, broad outline of a plan uh, and if we can get um, some dates perhaps for the workshop session and we can get we can get cracking on that uh, outside of um, obviously this meeting I'm happy because most of the things you're suggesting seem to align with what officers are suggesting, which obviously um, says that they are the right priorities. So that's a good thing. Um, I'll s that was that. All that we're both wrong. Yes. <laughs> um, we'll set up some workshops. Um, I'm guessing that you don't want to do that in August. I think it would possibly be difficult with attendance from people but we can start from September. The only other thing I was going to mention was the previous committee scrutinised the 
well, they tried to scrutinise the return on investment of the Velothon. They didn't have a lot of luck with it because um, th there isn't a lot of information that demonstrates that specifically. But I have got a report that has now been forwarded to, to me um, by the organiser for, for last year. And obviously they'll be doing a debrief and I expect they'll produce a report for the following year. But it took a long time to get that report. And the previous committee were trying to get the organiser to a meeting to discuss that with you, which we, we did fail miserably at, I'm afraid. So given that time is pushing on and as a new committee, you're looking at different priorities and possibly more urgent things now that are sort of coming into play. Um, is, it, is it worthwhile me sending you that report? And then if you decide you do want to call them in after, you know, they've had this debrief on this year, then, then we can do that. But if I send it to you, it's quite a large file, a few megabytes, but I'll send that after today if that's okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Hazel. Okay. Um, I think we've done nine well, it's, just, it's just a look i suppose what what, what yeah, it's, it's it's the same thing um and 10 obviously to outline um the uh council and cabinet business forward plan um the stand to fill up now um stand to populate with with um with material so i'd always advise um colleagues to, to keep an eye out on this plan it, um it's published on a friday isn't it friday afternoon um. The plan is kept on online and a link is sent to that on a Friday, but the email is more important that tells you what's been added and deleted because it is a live plan. So don't think that because you've seen it today that nothing will change before you see it next time. The reason for having the email every Friday from Democratic Services is to point out to you what's been added and deleted so that you know, you're you're aware of things and, and that it's not just a case of by the time you see it at the next meeting, something's already gone through as, as an urgent sort of decision that you didn't have sight of. Again, if you see anything in there that interests you and you want to have a look at the report, you're perfectly entitled to look at the report and you can ask the report author to send that to you. You know, if, if, if there's not time to bring it to scrutiny, if you think you want to bring it to scrutiny, speak to the chair and, and myself. But if it's just you've got an interest and you want to know more about it, then just ask the, the report author for sight of the report. OK. Yeah, I mean, Hazel and I will keep an eye out on, on those things. And if we think there's a real burning issue that we need an urgent meeting, an urgent call in before a decision is made, then we'll do that. But, you know, as Hazel said, do keep an eye out on it because there may be areas, issues for your particular areas, your particular um, boards you represent that, you know, you may find it of interest. And if you want more information, then that that would be great. So I don't think there's anything else. That you No. be consulted as a ward member if it was on a specific decision and you should be consulted but it is worthwhile keeping an eye out on that yeah. okay thank you for your for your indulgence your time your patience um and for your contributions it's been a it's been a good really good session um and um you know we look forward to digging digging deep on some of these um these really chunky issues that uh, uh, are going to mean um, a lot for our residents and for our county so thank you very much and good afternoon or oh, and as just a, as a really uh, good meeting chair really good meeting just an, as an addendum there is a there is um, um, a seminar this afternoon uh, on um, safeguarding uh, if you are available to to uh, to stay uh, it's not just for select committee members of that because it's because of our um, wider corporate uh, responsibility for safeguarding adults, um, it might be worth of interest. Thank you.